All right, good morning and welcome to the Vermont Legislature's House Committee on Environment and Energy. This morning we are taking up S5. Most of us is not muted. And we are going to welcome Matt Coda, the Director of Government Affairs at Meadow Hill Consulting. Welcome, Mr. Coda. Thank you, um, Chair and members of the House Environment and Energy Committee. As a way of introduction, my name is Matt Coda. I own a company called Meadow Hill Consulting. I have four clients that are in the thermal space and have interest in Senate Bill Number Five. It's the Split the Ticket Fund, which is a nonprofit 501c charity that I started 15 years ago. Includes the Northeast Hearth Patio and Barbecue Association, which are the manufacturers, the, the sellers, and the installers of wood and gas heating equipment. Includes the heating and cooling contractors of Vermont, which, in collaboration with Meadow Hill and the Vermont Fuel Dealers Association, is the largest provider of technical training for the heating industry in Vermont. You can see all of our classes at heatbt.com, where we train oil, gas, and heat pump technicians, and we also train um, tank installers. And of course, the Vermont Fuel Dealers Association, which is the most inclusive of all those organizations, because while primarily uh, oil, heat, kerosene, and propane retailers, it includes utilities, it includes supply warehouses, it includes heating service companies. It also is mostly uh, heating oil and propane retailers and wholesalers of heating oil, propane, and kerosene that are in state, <coughs> mostly out of state, as most of you will learn. So, explain in this testimony. So, I have 10 recommendations for Senate Bill number five, and I'm happy to present those plus the accompanying language. But I've also brought with me three individuals um, that represent different companies. Um, all across Vermont, from the northern part of Vermont to the southern part of Vermont, all are on the Connecticut River Valley. All, uh, all service customers in Vermont all sell all the energy products, heating oil, kerosene, <coughs> they install full climate heat pumps, as most of our companies do, um, and also service heating equipment. And so I want to make sure that they have plenty of time to speak, and I'm, so I'm happy to cut my testimony short and come back because I work here and they don't. But I do need to address what I think is the fundamental misconception about this legislation, which is that it is somehow a fee paid for by large companies. Indeed, there are large companies that will pay the fee. There's two very large companies, which are members of the VFDA, that support this legislation. But it has nothing to do with size. I understand there's some cognitive dissonance in this room about this. So I'm going to say it one more time. Whether or not you are obligated, under this legislation and required to make a quarterly payment to a designated default agent or prove that you have obtained or created credits in accordance with the law has nothing to do with the size of your company. Whether you sell 400 gallons or 40 million gallons, you are obligated under this legislation if you have title of the fuel when it enters into Vermont. That's it, that's the story. And because of an accident of geography, because we have no sea terminal, because we have no pipeline, whether or not you're obligated really depends on where you're at. So if you're in Bells Falls, like Tony James is sitting to my right, you are not going to drive to the Flint Avenue terminal on the south end of Burlington in order to purchase heating oil. You need three loads a day. If you can see the North Walpole terminal, from your office across the river in New Hampshire, make any sense at all that you would go to an in-state wholesaler of heating oil. So whether you sell 400 gallons or 40 million gallons, you are now obligated and required to compete in a credit market with some of the largest for-profit corporations that are in the energy space in Vermont. I want to put that out there because there's a lot of misinformation that's being spread that this is somehow a tax or a fee or something else on a large wholesalers. It is not. It doesn't have to be so, which is suggestion one of 10. Push it upstream. I think you'll hear from the Green Mountain Power Attorney that's going to testify later, as he testified in Senate, which is that it's a much more efficient program if the point of obligation is upstream. We agree. But that is not so. That is not how it exists in the bill that has passed the Senate. The point of obligation is the entity that takes possession of the fuel, takes title of the fuel when it crosses the border. 
And that's fundamentally how heating fuel is distributed. This performance standard is an amazing idea, but it has never been done before. Not California, not Oregon, not Colorado, never on heating oil, kerosene, and propane providers. When you, it is not comparable to the gasoline industry. The gasoline industry, they sell twice as many gallons and have half as many distributors. Why is that so? Because when you buy gasoline, you come to us. When we deliver heating oil and propane, we come to you. And a third of the trucks delivering it don't have green plates on them. New Hampshire, Massachusetts, and New York. 200 different entities scattered across Vermont. And if you're up in Burlington, you're up in Colchester, over by Mallets Bay, well, we know where you go. Go to the Global Terminal in Flint Avenue. If you're down in Bellows Falls, no. You are now obligated and now have to compete with some of these companies for these credit markets. So move the obligated party upstream. Number two, thermal only. We sell lots of heating oil. What's this? Number two, fuel oil, right? It's a great product. It goes in more than just your burner that creates hot air, hot water. Number two, fuel oil is used for lots of purposes. It powers school buses, farm tractors, generators, feller bunchers, skitters. Feller bunchers don't run on heat pumps. Sorry to say, we still sell it in the same truck, with the same delivery driver, the same company because our agricultural and our forest economy depends on this product. And there is no credit that someone's going to get from buying an electric feller buncher. Propane. Propane is used for power generation. Those propane generators sell amazingly every time there's a power outage. Demand for propane generators is astronomical. Get, uh, cooking. Propane is used for cooking. It's used for water heating. It's used for snow melt. It's used for a lot of purposes that have nothing to do with thermal and have no chance to find an alternative that earns credit under S5 as design. Restrict the gallons to thermal only. That's not done in this bill. As you've seen it from the Senate, you can do that. Number three, we got a kerosene conundrum. We got a boutique fuel. Number one fuel, right? What's different about kerosene? Why do people use kerosene still? It's like Jet A. The reason you use kerosene is because we have homes, homes that don't have basements. We all know what those homes are that don't have basements. They have to have an outdoor tank. So they could have propane, but they could have kerosene. They can't have heating oil and they can't have a renewable fuel like a biodiesel because of the gelling, right? So, we have homes that simply cannot have electric heat because they have no basement. They have water pipes that are exposed. You're going to hear from the gentleman that are going to come after me explaining all the homes that they're into where they have to give real advice to their customers who they see in the grocery store and at church on Sunday and at the Little League games. And they can't say, oh, just stamp in a Mitsubishi Mini Split and you don't need any more kerosene because that is not so. Those pipes will freeze and that home will be have damage. You can fix that. You can remove kerosene from the list of obligated fuels or to allow kerosene to propane conversions. The bill that you have before you does not do that. What about fuel assistance? Remember, we don't own oil wells. We're the retailers. We don't care what the, whatever the fuel is that keeps your home warm, that's the business that we're in. Fuel assistance, as many of you know, this winter spent $30,217,638. Almost entirely with fossil fuel companies. It is the largest subsidy for fossil fuel companies in Vermont. Less than 4% of fuel assistance customers, again, according to data readily available from the Office of Economic Opportunity, Richard Giddings, less than 4% are using electricity. Our prices are fixed, they're regulated through a margin over rack program. And how do they obtain those prices? Well, because we don't have access, because no one from Bells Falls is driving to Burlington to pick up a load of fuel. It is determined by the average of the average of four different terminals in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, Albany, New York, Burlington, Vermont, and um, Portsmouth. Portsmouth, Albany, Springfield, Massachusetts, and Burlington. The mar the now we'll talk about this on the next one, but 
that price is set not with a credit price. You're going to need to investigate what those credit costs are, <laughs> or you're going to need to exclude the gallon sold to fuel assistance. Otherwise, you've just ruined, you've just significantly reducing your buying capacity for fuel assistance. You're adding a credit cost to this because it's based on out of state, um, out of state rack prices. So that gets to the real, the nut of it, right? There's wide disagreement, misunderstanding of what the credit cost will cost per gallon. We've heard numbers as high as four dollars a gallon. That seems absurd. That seems like an economy-ending event. Um, we've heard seventy cents a gallon from the Secretary of Agency of Natural Resources. Understanding that the price per credit is based on the ability during those four years before we hit 2030, the four years starting January 1, 2026, when the first check will be written to the default, default delivery agent, of what will be needed in order to convince people to reduce the amount of fossil fuel they use here in Vermont commensurate with the 2020 Global Warming Solutions Act. So you're trying to convince people that have a perfectly good heating system in four years to buy a new one. Doesn't have to be that way. You could do two things in this committee. You could cap the price. So anyone that says it's 70 cents a gallon, no, 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 we've capped it. We made it a nickel, but we made it a dime. Can be less, but no more than 10 cents or five cents or seven and a half cents or whatever number you choose. You can do that. Or you could not make the 2030 event that's in law not make it the requirement of S5 that that's the number that you have to hit. So with the Public Utility Commission in a vacuum, got to follow the law, designs a program which in four years raises enough capital to convince enough people to install wood heat or electric heat that they are not restricted by that meeting that 2030 number. That can happen. Number six, fix the DDA. The DDA, as written by the Senate, can be not one, not two, as many as possible, entities. The designated default agent is who these fuel dealers who are all obligated will turn to in order to purchase credits in order to meet their compliance goals. Right now, that can be a for-profit company. Now, if I'm a for-profit company and I make the case before the Public Utility Commission that I should be the DDA, and I sell one product, I'm pretty sure that's how I'm gonna meet those goals of the DDA. I've just found amongst the more than 100 obligated party, 90% of them are small mom and pops, retailers, people in their communities delivering these services. I've found an interest-free source of capital, of funding, quarterly checks coming my way, if I can get through the PUC. Think about this. These are quarterly payments that fuel dealers would be required to make. And we sell more than half our gallons in just 90 days. So on Q4, the payment that has to happen on January 1 of 2026, based on Q4 of 2025, for a small company, for a small company, they might sell a million gallons in that quarter because it's cold. They sell a million gallons. Let's just pick a number just for argument's sake, and it's 75 cents for that credit. That DDA, that foreign owned for-profit company could get 75 cents a gallon from the honest dealer that pays exactly what they sold. But what about the ones that don't pay? The Senate made the penalty 4X for them. Four times that payment, that's $3 a gallon. That's more than the cost of the fuel itself. You sell propane for $2.50, you sold a million gallons in Q4 on January 1, you're gonna be required to pay 75 cents a gallon on that, $750,000. And if you fail to do that, or you're two days late, or the mail's not working, or maybe you were busy helping your customers stay warm, times four, that's the law. That's $3 million, more than the value of the company, more than the, not even more than the gross margin, not even more than the actual cost of the product to the consumer, it's more than the value of the companies. At that point, here are the keys, government. Or the government says, no, 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 that's too cool. You're providing an essential commodity that keeps people warm in January. We can't take the keys of your car, of your trucks. We can't lock you out of your, of your business. You're, you're helping Vermonters stay warm. <clears throat> well, at that point, say they, there's, a, uh, there's an act of forgiveness, an act of kindness. What about everyone else that's been paying? and has been charging that additional fee, that surcharge, 
in order to comply with the law. What happens to them? It's a conundrum. It's what they call a wicked problem in public policy. Fix the DDA. And the DDA, what if they, this for-profit foreign-owned conglomerate, accepts this money from Tony and from Rob and from Dennis and promises at the end of the year, we'll show you all of our accounting and we'll show you how we help reduce greenhouse gas emissions. But they don't. What's their penalty? Nothing. What if they abscond with the money to Florida? Nothing. There's no penalty in the law if the DDA fails to deliver greenhouse gas reducing technologies and services to Vermonters. There is no penalty. But you're a couple days late on that million dollar note, four times. Doesn't seem fair to the people that are actually doing the work and are actually keeping Vermonters warm. Number eight, almost done. Greet is good. Now, there's wide disagreement on how much biofuels should play in this new energy transformation. Certainly, electricity is going to be part of it. These three gentlemen will tell you they install electric heat, they can tell you anything you want to know about it. But we also think that biofuels will play a critical role. But what the Senate did, difference to what H715 did last year, is they reduce the ability for us to use biofuels, liquid biofuels and gaseous biofuels and wood pellets in order to meet our compliance goals, right? At a certain point, the services that we deliver for credits have to be services and not fuel. You heard that. You also heard that in the outer years, there has to be less of a dependence on biofuels and more on equipment, such as electric heat pumps. Not the fuel itself, but the equipment that goes in. Change that change, change the stipulation that it not follow the GREET standard, which is the greenhouse gas regulated emissions and energy use and transportation. That's the national standard for figuring out how much greenhouse gas emissions is in each energy source. That's good. GREET is good. That is the national standard. We have not that. In, in S5, we have, it could be that, or it could be some other methodology which fits Vermont. That scares me. Number nine, you get the wrong regulator. We have, all, we have an alphabet soup of regulators. IRS, EPA, DC, ANR, weights and measures. Um, we don't have the DPS. We don't have the PUC, though. And in fact, when you talk to them tomorrow, they'll admit they don't have this map. It's publicly available, vermontfuel.com forward slash find. But they don't have, thank you very much. But they don't know who we are. They don't know how many are coming from out of state. <clears throat> how are they possibly going to take a trip down to Keene and knock on the door of a, of a Keene dealer that delivers fuel in Brattleboro and say, hey, we've got this thing called this obligation and you've been bringing fuel into Vermont. Um, we're going to need a payment. <laughs> how is that going to work? Remember, a third of the trucks delivering fuel don't have green plates. This is not the motor fuel industry where you come to us to pick up the fuel and we, you, you, we go to you. And those trucks drive freely over the border in the middle of the night. How possibly, what would be the agent that could stop a truck and determine whether or not they are delivering at four in the morning, that they are in fact registered and are compliant with the clean heat standard, the Affordable Heat Act? The only one entity that could do that. DOT, it's the DMV, it's the men and women with trucks with, with, with they have badges and guns and lights, and they pull over our trucks all the time, making sure that we're following the law. PUC has none of that. And I don't think there's money in the budget to enforce the borders, to get the PUC to ensure that every single entity that delivers fuel in Vermont, the more than 100 obligated parties, it's all in black and white, it's no, no confusion here, more than 100 obligated parties that deliver fuel in Vermont, how possibly they are going to get them to comply. And failure to do so means that the local companies that live in their communities, that pay taxes in their communities, that are in the church, the links, the select boards, they're the ones that are punished. They're the ones that are punished. Seems like a heck of a way. You designed a disaster to disrupt the distribution of an essential commodity. It should stop. But if it does happen, number 10, July, not January. We are super busy in December. And most of these companies that deliver these fuels now, hopefully in the future, but right now, are mom and pops. The idea that during the 
busiest time of the season. January 1 is when this is implemented. And when we brought that up in the Senate, we said, can you move it to July? We're super busy and we don't have lawyers that can do this. We're, we're out straight. And the answer we got was, if we want to make it more difficult for you to deliver fossil fuels, we should make it more difficult for you to deliver. And that's not, that's how you design a disaster. That is not how you distribute an essential commodity that for every five Vermonters need heat, hot water, and cooking. Respectfully ask you to make these 10 changes. And I get to cede my time to the individuals who are a lot smarter than I am regarding how we take care of Vermonters to make sure that they're safe and warm. Thank you for that testimony. Um, are you, I assume you can provide us that in a written format? So Absolutely. In case we missed something, that was packed full. Um, do members have questions? Uh, Representative Pat. Uh, Earlier in your testimony, you, you, one of your recommendations was to um, push the responsibility upstream. Could you say a little bit more about who, where, and who, who, who that would be and who it wouldn't be compared to what, what is in the bill of the Senate? So here's the conundrum we're in. I think we all agree, and advocates would agree, and I think Mr. Hand would tell you, and so would Mr. Murphy, that the Ideal situation from a compliance standpoint is further upstream, ideally at the well, right? As we do have with some federal tax policy where it comes out of the ground or when it comes in by ship. We can't do that in Vermont. And that's our problem. Could you do it like the Transportation Climate Initiative in a regional approach since we're so interdependent on one another? Fuel comes from Quebec, it comes from Albany. It comes from Springfield, Massachusetts. It comes from Boston. It comes from Portsmouth, New Hampshire. It comes by train from points west. How could you do it in a way? Well, a regional approach would probably be the only way because we're up against, as you know, the dormant commerce clause. So I think with good intentions, my discussions with Chris Neamey at Energy Futures Group and Richard Coward at um, Regulatory Assistance Project, who have had discussions about this legislation since... July of 2021, which is how do you accomplish that? And what we're up against is the fact that fuel is fundamentally, heating fuel is fundamentally different, is distributed differently because again, we take, bring it to you because of the way our geography works. So I would like to say that there is a legal pathway so that the wholesalers of fuel, not the retailers, the out-of-state wholesalers will be ultimately responsible for paying the the fee in all of my companies that, that, that install electric heat pumps, they would be credit earners and not be obligated. But that is not so because this is not a regional approach. This is a this is a Vermont goes it alone approach. And because of the dormant commerce clause, it's my fear that, and as discussions with some of the authors at Energy Futures Group and, and Regulatory Assistance Project, that in fact we can't have that ideal. So we must have the imperfect, which is more than 100 obligated parties and five wholesalers. Those are the in-state wholesalers. So this is, this, is a, this is a, I don't have an easy answer for this, but if there's a way, if you hear from the Green Mountain Power Attorney or, or the Assistant Attorney General that there is a way, grab it. I don't know if there's a way without a regional approach. Uh, I have a couple of questions. So you said you represent the Vermont fuel dealers and there were utilities in that group. Who are those utilities? Vermont Gas Systems and Efficiency Vermont are dues paying members of the Vermont Fuel Dealers Association. There are members that support this legislation. They are largely the large companies and utilities. Um, there is one small member that supports it as well, which you may hear from later today. But the board of directors of the Vermont Fuel Dealers Association which is largely comprised, almost entirely comprised of small family fuel dealers. So the name on the side of the truck is the person driving the truck or the person answering the phone at 2 a.m. They do not support this legislation. They're asking you to vote against it, Ezra. Um, and then we've, we've heard from a couple of perspectives on trying to focus on thermal only. Is that possible to do? Can you separate the fuels out in the way that they are? If I may highlight and 
to support a piece of this legislation which, or a discussion that came along with my many discussions with Energy <laughs> Futures Group and, and Regulatory <laughs> Assistance Project and some of the other um, real, real smart policy thinkers here, including uh, Secretary Moore, which is the way we have accounted for or, or collected information on propane, heating oil, and kerosene in dyed diesel sales in Vermont, how do I say this gently, uh, is flawed. So we pay on heating oil, propane, kerosene, dyed diesel fuel. Remember, it's the same product, number two fuel oil. Sell the farmer, sell the, your home. Is all aggregated into one number that we pay on the 25th of the month on form FG615. That's the fuel tax. That's the two cents per gallon. Believe it or not, a farmer that's getting dyed diesel or his farm tractor, the locomotive, the train, the Amtrak train, the, the, uh, uh, the feller puncher, they're actually paying into the weatherization farm. <laughs> we, at the time when it went from half a percentage point to two cents a gallon 10 years ago, 12 years ago, we suggested they, they take that out. And the issue was, is, well, no, because you're all in the same form. And it's one number, and you add up propane, kerosene, dye, diesel, heating oil, and then you add it and you multiply by 0.02 and you put it in the form. That was the excuse then. I don't think that should be the excuse now. We should break out that number. And when you do that, you immediately remove dye, diesel for the farmer. You could plausibly say, hey, listen, the number that you collect when you pay the tax to the tax department, we're breaking out dye, diesel. It's no longer going to be obligated under this new law that we're creating. You could do that. Um, when it comes to, so that's easy. When it comes to process fuels or, um, or non-thermal uses of gas, such as heating, or, excuse me, such as natural gas or propane, it's a little bit more complicated because again, we deliver propane to a thousand gallon tank. You may use it for generator and cooking and hot water and heat, but we don't want you to burn it, right? And we don't want to set up separate tanks for that. You don't want to set up separate tanks for that. You don't want multiple tank, propane tanks there. So it becomes a little bit more problematic from a consumer level to break out cooking gas, admittedly, from our sales. However, industrial users, no, you could break that out. Um, we do that with, for instance, the sales tax exemption to manufacturers. If you're a business, you pay 6% sales tax on your heating fuel or your process fuels, unless you have a manufacturer's exemption and then you don't pay the 6%. Remember, we, there's the petroleum cleanup fee, one cent. There's the fuel tax, that's two cents. And there's a 6% sales tax if you're a business, unless you're a manufacturer. So there is a way for large users, if, but not in the laws written or legislation is written. Um, right now, everyone's in. We think that should change. Um, Representative Tori and then Celia. Thank you, Matt. Um, the two cent fee. Mm -hmm. Is that all for weatherization? What else does it? Cover? So it's, it's not a fee, it's a tax. tax. It's called the fuel tax. We pay it monthly and it's all for low income weatherization. Oh. It used to be, it was started in 1990 as a fuel gross receipts tax. And it was uh, one half of 1%. And then in 2011 or 12, I've been here since 2007, um, we changed it to be a cents per gallon tax and was moved to two cents. And at various times it's been recommended that we increase it because um, for low income weatherization. Do, do you know how much that generates? It's about $10 million a year for the low income weatherization program, but it's also on natural gas, not as a cent per gallon because they don't sell gallons, um, but it's still a gross receipts tax on electricity, natural gas, and coal for the liquid fuels that, that, are, that are regulated by gallons by the Agency of Agriculture. It's, uh, it's a cent per gallon, two cents per gallon. So propane, dye diesel, heating oil, kerosene, two cents a gallon. For the other product, energy products, it's at, oh shoot, it's 0.75% of their retail sales. But I, you'd have to check with the my gas people. Representative Sebelia. Actually, I think I'm all set. All right. Uh, remember, other questions from committee members? Thank you again for your testimony. Right. Thank you very much. Next up, I have Tony James. Or <coughs> James and James Plumbing. Welcome, Mr. James. Good morning. Thank you. Um, Tony Thank James, you. James Plumbing and Heat and Oil out of Bellis Falls. Um, 
born and raised in Vermont. Joe's to stay here, brought a family business, take it over, buy it out. Um, started in the plumbing and heating. My folks did in 1967. Um, primarily service installations before we got into the fuel oil. Um, so, so heat pumps would be a service guy's dream. Um, but there's not enough help. There's not enough workforce to um, meet the demand, demand of what S5 would require um, to, to meet the criteria. Um, we started in the, the fuel business um, in 1995, fuel oil sales, and then propane sales in 2009. Um, the credits that we would be required to pay as far as the workforce goes, um, we can pump out a fair amount of oil. There's no way we can meet the credit um, regulation. Um, you know, it, it petrifies me that, that the way S5 is written, this would put us out of business in probably two to five years of being in place. Um, I think it's gonna put out a lot, of, a lot of mom and pop, as Matt said, most of the fuel companies in Vermont are um, mom and pop shops. Um, my staff is running about uh, at six right now. <clears throat> I could be at 12 and, and love it. The workforce is not, not there. Um, it, you know, it's, it's stressful. It's, um, it, you know, so if we start putting heat pumps in, everybody and their brother's starting to put heat pumps in. People have never been in the business. They're going out, they're getting trained, they're getting educated. Um, they're installing heat pumps. Um, and, and pardon me if it seems like I'm bouncing you know, when, when I first, I'm going to back up a little bit here. When I first talked to Matt about this, I started taking notes at pages and pages and pages. And he's like, you have six minutes, which I think is really unfair. Um, so I, I, I take my notes down to one, one paper of about seven bullet points that I'm going to talk about. So I'm just trying to, to bounce and, and touch a little bit on everything and, and utilize my six minutes. If I, if I could interrupt. I guess six I, minutes, six I'm gonna clarify. Yeah, six minutes, I, said, I so, want to apologize. Okay. Never, I, I just, I will, I want to clarify, there was never a six yeah. minute limit. Okay. And in fact, we, Sorry, Matt. we scheduled Matt to have 45 and the three of you to have 45. Oh, cool, I didn't, I didn't yeah. know that. So yeah. thank you, appreciate that. Yeah, that was that was, a, that was a comment made in the Senate committee, which Tony also testified in. I apologize, Chair, that, was not, that was not something I said about this committee. So sorry about that, misunderstood that. So, so with the heat pumps, I'll try and slow down a little then. Um, <laughs> with, with the heat pumps, um, last time I came and testified, I think it was like 12 degrees that morning. By six o'clock that night, it was eight, eight below. Um, a lot of my reps will tell you, heat pumps will, will heat your house to 70 degrees at 14 below zero. I tell them, when you go meet with me and we're talking to my customers and, we're selling them heat pumps. We're getting them to transition over. Don't tell any of you that, that I have to see in the grocery store, the local meat market, the football game in church, because it doesn't matter when someone, you don't meet their needs and their expectations. It doesn't matter if you're in church, you're, you're standing there in the grocery store at the local football game. They want to beat you up. They verbally, they want to just sit there and, and hammer away on you and, and tell you how the heat pumps did not perform, how they didn't work. That you, 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 you sold them a bill of goods that, that you lied about. Um, when I meet with every one of my, my customers, people I know in my community, in my area, my service area, I tell them right out the bat, 33 degrees, shut them off. Knowing that, oh, they're probably going to try and run them 20, 18 degrees. They'll be satisfied. They'll be happy. I met their expectations. Um, some people are like, I heated my house great down, down to zero. It all depends on location of the outdoor unit. Um, the style of house, how new the house is, how tight it is. Um, a lot of traditional Vermont homes, um, it, you know, it's very difficult. Last time I testified when it was 12 degrees and 20 below the next morning, my number one call was frozen pipes. It didn't matter if it was hydronic baseboard outside walls or their domestic um, hot and cold water. A lot of people were trying to heat their, their homes with heat pumps. That failed to happen. They switched over to their, their fossil fuels. Um, when they did that, at that point, the pipes were froze, they're calling us out. I, um, I tried to triage our calls. Um, I was out in the field with my guys, um, thawing pipes out, but, but our number one priority was if you had no heat, our, our obligation was to get their heat up and running. Um, and then we'd come back and thaw out pipes. 
mobile homes. Mobile homes are designed where typically up underneath the mobile home, there's a insulation blanket right from the factory. It's sealed nice and tight. You have ductwork that goes down through the center of the mobile home. Usually the pipes either run right next to it or in that ductwork. So if you had a heat pump system that took the place of the furnace and blew down through the ducts, as long as we didn't get down below that 20 degrees, their pipes are probably not gonna freeze. It starts getting 20 degrees and uh, pushing that zero mark, they're without water. Um, you know, people say, well, they can heat tape. Heat tapes are my last resort. Um, I try to never use a heat tape in, unless we absolutely have to. Heat tapes, if installed wrong, a lot of homeowners, they can't afford to call a plumber at today's rates. They install a heat tape, it's wrong, it's gonna cause a fire. Um, so, so the issue with mobile homes, um, which there's a lot of in Vermont, those, those folks are gonna be without hot and cold water when, when they're forced down this path of the heat pumps. Um, <clears throat> one of my biggest concerns is if this tax fee goes through, um, businesses in Vermont, whether you're the, the fuel company supplying it, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pass on the fees. Um, my biggest concern is I'm passing on those fees. Again, I'm down in Bellas Falls, Vermont. I'm right on the border of the Connecticut River in New Hampshire. Um, I see trucks every day from Massachusetts and, and New Hampshire. I don't know how you plan on regulating them. I won't be able to compete with them coming out of Keene or, or Greenfield, Mass. If they're not paying paying the fees, if I'm if I'm seventy cents more per gallon, um, it, it, it's not not going to work. Um, if you're a company in Southern Vermont and you're having to pay these taxes, you're either going to go with a New Hampshire company or you're going to jump into New Hampshire to run your business. We have a couple of questions. If you yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry, go ahead. Instead of Stebbins and then Smith. What is the heat tape? Is that electric resistant? It, it's a it, it's a electric wire that generates heat approximately specifically along the pipe. Yep, you wrap it around the pipe. Yep. Thanks. Is that Smith? Thank you. Uh, where you're located, where a lot of the fuel dealers are located throughout the state, you're near a border. Is it going to be? Or have you heard people say, I'm going to put 55 gallon drums in my truck and I'm going to go to New Hampshire and get my heating fuel? Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm going to burn. a lot. I, I hear it a fair amount. I mean, people right now, um, you, you folks are voted in by the people. And I don't know how much research you've done if you've reached out. I mean, no one's reached out to me as a company. <clears throat> I talked to Christy Morris about it about a year ago. Um, he's the only person in, in the state house that I've talked to about my, my thoughts on S5. Talking to customers, they're, they're up in arms. It's not like they're saying, well, we've got to make the change. I haven't heard one of them say that. I mean, we're all about saving the planet. Don't get me wrong. But I haven't heard one say, oh, geez, we've we got to make the change no matter what the cost is. They're all like, this is insane. I'll, I'll, I'll haul my fuel. I'll go put a 55-gallon drum or a 275 in the back of my truck. Is it legal or illegal to, for an individual to go to New Hampshire and buy their heating fuel and bring it back? No, they can do whatever they want. Yeah. It's legal. So well, that's going to hurt every business here in Vermont, isn't it? It's going to hurt them no matter what with this kind of uh, tax fee. Mm. I, I mean, there's a lot of people, rather they have a, a big facility building, that they have to heat the building. But all depending on what they manufacture. I have accounts that are large fuel users that use a ton of oil, um, number two heat and fuel, um, diesel, just, just in their production, whether it's outside or inside. That's not going to be cost effective for them to stay in business in Vermont when they can just jump across a river a mile, mile and a half away and set up shop. And it's not just Bellis Halls, North Albany. It's going to be Brown Road. It's going to be Bellis Halls. It's going to be Windsor, Scotney, right up through. Thank you. Are there further questions? Representative Tory? Thank you. Um, a while back, I remember hearing shortage of fuel. <clears throat> so 
How's it going? I, I started the oil side of my parents' business. Oil side became mine in 1995. Drivers were in demand. They were great. Today, um, I'm driving my truck nonstop. I, I get up early in the morning so I can go in and establish a workload for the guys, women, um, make sure we're good to go for the day. I try to be in the truck at 6.30, 7 a.m. Yesterday morning, I didn't get in the truck till 11 a.m. So I worked till 8 o'clock at night so I could be here today. Um, it's, it's painful. There's, there's a massive shortage of drivers. Um, it's, it's difficult. Sorry to hear. So like it, that. It's all, all, all part of business. You, you do what you got to do to make it go. All right, great. Maybe finish. So, no, go ahead. Keep going. If, yes, yeah. I mean, we, we do, yes, we have two more to hear from and need to take a break before. We're... So just, uh, you know, my biggest concern is, yes, I'm here for me and my company, a, a good portion, but I'm also a community person. I'm here, not just about my community, about my state. People can't afford this bill. They can't, it, it's set up in the wrong direction. It's bad enough there's a one cent. When I deliver to Hampshire, I take my gallons, if it's 100 gallons, and it's 409.9 a gallon, New Hampshire residents get a bill for $409.90. I get doing the bill for Vermont, it's $490. Then I have my one cent tax, so then that's a, another buck. Then I do my two cent tax, so it's another two bucks. And then if you're a business, there's a 6% tax in there, and it's just tax after tax after tax when I'm in Vermont. And then I go a quarter mile across a river and it's gallons times a dollar. Um, we need to figure out a way um, besides what, what, I mean, we're calling the Affordable Clean Heat Act. Um, I call it the Affordable Clean Heat Act. All right, that's my fire pager. Um, I'm on the fire department too. Um, I just ask that, we vote down S5. People can't afford taxes. Um, revisit it. Come up with a solution that works. Um, that, that could be another half a day of discussing what works. No one has come to me as a, as a business, and this is what I do for a living, said, hey, what, what do you suggest? Um, there's a lot of ideas. I'm, I would love it. Actually, if your testimony was on that, it would be, would be really great. Um, I, I could go all day on on changes. There's a lot of old homes in Vermont, whether it's Bellis Falls, Barry, Springfield, um, apartment houses that have four or five, six boilers pumping pollution into the air. Those houses can heat on one boiler. We need to mandate to landlords that, hey, as these boilers get old, you have to abandon this boiler and add this tenant's heat to this boiler and include it. To top it off, the state of Vermont is supplying fuel assistance to most of these tenants. And, and talk about redesigning and saving money, the fuel assistance that once you get that six family apartment house down to from six boilers down to one, or maybe two that talk to each other and modulate, because you may, may need to if it's a big enough building, but you're only running one boiler probably 80% of the time. I mean, that, that would be for starters. I mean, just the amount of money the state would save in fuel assistance. And you no longer have six burners pumping pollution out of six boilers. You, you have one boiler, maybe two tops if it's a large building. Um, nobody's addressed that. Um, my dad's house, we went from five heating systems to, to one boiler, along with one wood boiler because he heats with wood. He did. Um, I heat with oil and wood. My biggest concern is, is F, S, S5 becomes law. You're going to have 475,000 Vermonters burning wood. They're going to be going to tractor supply. They're going to be going to uh, Home Depot. They're going to be buying wood stoves. They're going to improperly install them. House fires are going to be on the rise. Um, oil at 409 a gallon. House fires are on a rise this year. I think in the month of uh, roughly between November and December, Vermont had five fatal house fires, mainly in southern Vermont. In the, in the first rough month of, of heating season, 
there's there's a lot of changes to be made. I asked that you guys shoot down S5 this year. And um, if anyone likes to want, wants to talk about it, I'd be more than happy to give you all the time in the world. All right. Thanks for your testimony. Thank you. Thanks, Toby. Um, members, we will, I think we'll we'll go to Dennis Percy, general manager of Fred's Energy. Welcome, Mr. Percy. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm from Derby, Vermont. Uh, I'm in Fred's Energy at four locations, approximately 15,000 customers. Uh, take care of all northern Vermont, Richford, Morrisville, and the Bill and Derby. Last I knew, we were the second largest fuel assistance dealer in the state of Vermont. And I can say that. You know, if we go out here and start putting heat pumps in low income homes, uh, pay for them, that's a great thing. Uh, they won't service them because they don't have the funds. They won't replace them because they don't have the funds if they break. So, because we're finding that out now with the fuel assistance uh, and the, we work closely with the weatherization companies. Uh, we're out there cleaning furnaces and getting people heat when they have no heat with the weatherization companies, trying to put in, well, we put in new furnaces for them when they call us up. And when we go out there and clean these furnaces for the weatherization people, uh, they haven't been serviced for years. They don't have the funds. Then all of a sudden, they go in and weatherize the house, okay, the insulate, talk around the windows and do whatever, which is a great thing. Uh, a lot of these places, excuse my expression, you can throw a cat through the wall. It's, uh, that's my idea of let's cut back on fossil fuels is we can cut fuel costs immensely by putting new, new furnaces in new heating systems. We've cut up to 50% of uh, heating costs in gallons uh, by putting in new equipment. Uh, we put in heat pumps all the time. We've been putting in heat pumps for 10 years. I'll be right up front with you. I won't tell a customer it's gonna heat your house in December, January. It made more for milder climates. Uh, you can go out there in December, January, and the customer will complain. We're not getting any heat out of the heat pump. Well, they go into a, into a defrost cycle. If they go into the defrost cycle, it doesn't put out any heat. It blows cold air. So there's some downfalls. Uh, the people that we put in heat pumps for had good intentions of using them for the winter. Uh, we have a local library that we put heat pumps in right across the road. And as a matter of fact, we donated to the library and we told them put some fossil fuel in too. And they argued, didn't want to do that because they want to be total green. We got the phone call in January. This was back four or five years ago. And <coughs> we can't afford to run these things. Well, we told them turn to the, turn the propane heaters on, which they do every year. Uh, I just see that we're opening ourselves up a failure to the public in Vermont. Uh, I, won't, I won't lie to them. I'm going to tell them right up front. They're not going to heat your house. Um, I just did an estimate last week on a house uh, for the second floor. They had propane heaters on the first floor. Nice house. It's probably within the last 15 years. $29,000 to do four bedrooms and an office upstairs. And the people that we put in heat pumps for, probably 75% of them, unless they have a brand new home. I just built a brand new home for heat pumps in it. I'm not using them in the dead of winter. My objection or my reasoning for it was spring and fall. I have radiant heat in the floor. If you try to heat out of the ceiling, I mean, <clears throat> cold floors, all you're doing is moving cold air around on the floor. It's not comfortable. So there's some good points about heat pumps. 
but there's some all, also some bad points. Uh, I won't send my, my service text out there in the middle of the night or uh, on a day that's zero degrees to work on a heat pump. And we service everything we sell. Like Tony said, the workforce. I employed 96 people, and they're not all service techs. Uh, we're out there 24 seven, 365 days a year. I can, on a no heat call with a fossil fuel, I can go out here and have them heat within an hour. Most of the time, if the boiler goes, I can have them heat within a day. We'll put temporary heaters in. I can't do that with heat pumps. Uh, a lot of times, and in the last 10, 10 to 15 years, heat pumps have advanced a lot in the industry where they're working in colder temperatures. We're not there yet. We're not there. It's not going to work at uh, 10 below zero. They start losing their efficiency. So, and I, I go down Main Street in Derby and I go down Main Street in Derby Line and a lot of these houses are built in the 1800s. There's no way possible that you're going to heat these houses with heat pumps. Uh, they're old houses. A lot of those people are retired. A lot of those people are on Social Security and try to <clears throat> force them to put an alternative heat source in when they have a heating system in there that's 50 years old and they can't afford to change that because they're on a fixed income. And I find that all the time. <clears throat> and if they would just come out and incentivize more efficient heating systems to cut their fuel costs and their gallons of fuel used, well, here we are, we cut the carbon footprint. I think we've, we've put the cart before the horse here. Uh, there's not been enough study out there to, to know where we're headed here, but I think we're headed into disaster. Uh, as far as employees, it's constant. I'm training probably seven people right now in the four locations, and it's constant. Since COVID hit, I don't know where people are getting their money. Uh, I have signs out there for employment all summer long, all winter long, and just to get people come through the door. And I think we pay the average scale uh, as far as employees for licensed plumbers and, and heating technicians, and we give them the training, we send them to school. Uh, right now, I've got a guy down in New Hampshire at the trade school, incentivize those people to get training and stuff, because if you're going to push heat pumps out here, you need to put work. I'm not going to serve somebody else's heat pump that somebody else has put in. And there's a lot of people out there putting heat pumps in that have no clue of fixing them. They can install them and it's not rocket science to install them. But to go out there and service it, you're gonna have the ability to troubleshoot. So, you know, I just sat here and look at where we're headed with this. And, and one of the things that bothers me the most is, you know, all you folks here are representing people back home. And I talk to more people and they don't even know what S5 is. You know, last month or so, uh, fuel dealers have been putting advertisements out there. These people are blind and we're gonna shove something right up their nose and they're gonna feel it. You know, 70 cents a gallon at a minimum. <clears throat> now I sat here and look at going to the grocery store. You go to the grocery store. How many people here have seen groceries go up? Well, every one of these industries, and we don't have a lot of industry up in the Northeast Kingdom. You're going to put a hurt <clears throat> because they got to heat their home. They got to heat their businesses. And I see, you know, Fuel dealers, one of the senators at the, when we were standing out in the hall, when they were going to go vote, he stood right in front of us and said, you fuel dealers are making way too much money for many years. It's time to put a stop to it. 
There's no guarantees that a fuel company is going to make money. We go out there and deliver 200 gallons of fuel, $1,000. We're at that customer's mercy for them to pay for it. And there's been so many people out there that have had good credit over the years. All of a sudden, somebody gets sick. They can't pay their bill. But we're sitting there holding on to that. You know, we try to get people. We've been in business 50 years. These customers are our livelihood. And we try to do whatever we can to keep people in heat. I don't know if you're going to find that. If you're switching everything over to electric and the power goes out and stuff, our hands are tied. So the whole, the whole thing in a nutshell is, is, you know, we've done things, uh, made changes. And I don't know if we're going down the right road or not. You know, we put ethanol in the gasoline. What did that do for us? Screwed up the engines. We put death in the diesel engines. What did that do for us? Screwed up the engines. Cost more money. We all absorb that. Whether you all think of it or not, we're all sitting there absorbing all these extra costs because it just gets passed right down. And, you know, I can sit here and say that if this thing passes, we might just hold our hands up and say, hey, we're not doing any fuel assistance. There's companies that have opted out of it. When they can sit here and come in here and tell us what we can charge or whatever, and that's what the fuel assistance does. They tell us what we can charge a customer and the state of Vermont pays the bill by all means. We're here to help people, but we can't fight the city hall. And that's what it's amounting to. This bill is putting us out of business. They pay these uh, credits and stuff. You know, I, I picture this whole bill like a divorce. You don't know what the end result's going to be until you <laughs> sign the paper. And when that happens, oh, well, suck it up because we're all bitten by that same horse. So please think about it because I think we're just opening ourselves up for failure all the way around. Representative Smith has a question. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. <laughs> uh, in the Fred's service area, cover quite a bit of area. Do you know how many mobile homes there are? Oh, guessing? We have trailer park after trailer park. And the majority of those people are elderly. Are there a thousand mobile homes or more? I wouldn't dare to put a number to it. Yeah. But, you know, between Lindenville and, and Derby, and, you know, I look at the areas where you <laughs> stole area. There's a lot of second homes there. You know, I, I see that uh, there's, there's a lot of money in that area. You get into Richford, Derby, and Lindaville, there's not a lot of industry, lot, not a lot of jobs and stuff. Mm -hmm. So people are struggling. And yep. With all these, you know, the American way is people spend what they make. And I find it, we pay a pretty decent scale. And... I find with employees, what they'll do is they'll spend according to what they make. Well, you're going to have homes that are going to get repossessed. You're going to have people that just aren't going to make it when you start putting 70 cents a gallon onto their, onto their plate. So I'd like to ask you another question about heat pumps. Do they also provide, they're new to me. Do they also provide air conditioning? Yes. That's so somebody's going to use twice as much energy because, wow, I've got an air conditioner now. I'm going to use this because when it gets hot in the summer. And that's what has happened. Majority of the people we put heat pumps in for that never had air conditioning that lived without it, all of a sudden, oh, we got air conditioning. So who, who gains out of that power company? Now, I think we've all heard that in the summertime, when it's extremely hot, they'll tell you, conserve on power. Well, the grid can't handle it. So, and I talked to the guys that work on the lines and stuff, and this, our, the grid is old. And I'm getting figures, and I can't, I can't guarantee this, but they're saying to increase the grid in Vermont, you're looking at $2 billion. Okay, here we go again. 
who's going to absorb that? I've already, you know, Barton Electric just came out, <clears throat> sent rate hike. It's, it's just New Hampshire, the guy that bought the car wash in, in Derby, raised his power 40%. It's coming. It's coming. And, and what are we going to do? We're just going to add fire to the, to the whole thing by adding all this more, much more electric heat and heat pumps. My suggestion is, is hey, let's put more efficient systems in, cut the carbon footprint, the fuel the fuel over the last 25, 30, 40 years has been so refined that the carbon footprint out of that is less than wood. And you're going to have everybody out there burning wood? We're going in the wrong direction. I got well, okay. one more question for me. Uh, okay. It'll be short. Uh, $3,500 for a heat pump. I've seen those numbers. Is there any truth to it? No. 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 Yeah, five five grand. Sorry to butt in. You, you, you minimum <laughs> with with the the technology where it is today, it, you can shop multiple suppliers for a reliable cold climate heat pump that will perform in this climate. Minimum one head, five grand yeah. minimum. Okay. So, then, for the record, you actually just get if you state who you are and then we'll oh. try to minimize these kind of interruptions. But and it will be more if it's an old house and you have to do a lot of wiring. Am I right or wrong? A lot of the houses, you know, if you have a house that's probably 20 years old, you might have a 200 amp service in your house. If you don't, and you're trying to do the wall green, if you've got 100 amp service in there, you ain't got enough power. You ain't got enough power to heat a heat it and put heat pumps in. I just built a new home. I put four heat pumps in, two outside condensers, and I tried to go electricity. And here I am in the fuel business. And to go as green as I could. Then I find out after I get it all done with a 200 amp service, I don't have enough power to, to put an electric charging station in for a car. So, you know, that's a big expense for anybody out there that's having to increase it. First off, they only get 100 amp service. Yeah, you can change it to a 200 amp service, but then you got to change the line out to the pole to a 200 amp service. And then the power company a lot of times is now they have to change a transformer on the pole because it isn't heavy enough to handle the load that you have. And then they tell me they're a year out. So, <laughs> you know, we need to do a lot of study on this because the carrot's before the horse. Representative. So that's one of those things. A couple more questions for you. I just want to make sure we get to them. Representative Sebelia and then Clever. Yes. Uh, thank you for your testimony and for traveling here to speak with us today and share your expertise. How much are you paying for um, your folks? You said you're paying them a, a good wage. For technicians and stuff? It's any range as far as uh, air conditioning technician, 30, 35 bucks an hour. Okay. Okay. Um, and then I just wanted to, um, regarding uh, the power and the grid. So I think those are two different things, um, how much power we have and uh, the resilience of our grid. And I think we've seen a lot with um, the stronger storms that we're seeing because of climate change. Um, we've seen uh, that uh, we need to harden our grid, but in terms of power that is available for Vermonters in our grid, we are, we've taken testimony over the years with plenty of power. Mm -hmm. So those are. Uh, so is it the lines that yes. can't carry it? Uh, the lines, because of the stronger storms, because of climate change, uh, we are racing to harden. And there's a lot of federal funding that is coming in here to work on that right now. I would agree with you. There's a lot of things we're trying to do all at once, mm -hmm. um, including with hotter weather, um, ensure that Vermonters can keep cool. Um, and so even though this bill doesn't require you to take out your heating system and put in a heat pump uh, for those that do have it, that ability to cool your home um, as we're seeing heat increase uh, from climate change may be important. So, again, thank you for your testimony. And it's really important for you all to come and share your experience with us. So, well, like Tony said, this is our livelihood mm -hmm. and we're going to fight for it. And, you know, all I'm asking is I think we're all in the same boat here. We all want to 
save the, the climate or what have you. And it will happen. It's happening. We've seen it happen over the last 10 years. But it's happened at people's expense to do that on their own and make that decision whether they want to go that route or not. It's not like we're having to force them and to penalize them in order to do that. And of course, we're not forcing them in this bill either. Well, you're not forcing them, but you're going to add money to their heating fuel. Along with a tremendous amount of federal and state funding that is coming in to help augment um, okay. programs yeah, like fine. this. And, and will that dry up? Yeah. Um, Representative Clifford. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you for your testimony. Yeah. How many employees do you have? 96. People have families? So they would just, just, and I'm sure you all do. Um, so saying if you ever had to go out of business, then I'll, I'll, also those families would suffer as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then where are they going to go work? They've learned a trade. A lot of them are at the age where they're not going to start over. Right. So at that point, they can go on the system. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Um, next, we have Rob Stanger, owner of Simple Energy. <laughs> Welcome, Mr. Stanger. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you all. I appreciate the invitation and opportunity to speak to you today. Um, I'll back up a little bit and apologize for uh, butting in. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a type A entrepreneur. I'm 100 miles an hour, hair on fire. Uh, don't always follow the rules. Uh, I'm going to do my best to share my experience and perspective with you all today. Uh, today marks the third time that I've spoken to members of the Vermont legislature um, dating to a, a year ago um, when it, uh, under a different name, but very similar uh, piece of legislation and twice uh, this year. Um, I'll back up in, in terms of full disclosure. My name is Rob Stanger. I'm the owner of Simple Energy Partners. Uh, we are headquartered in West Lebanon, New Hampshire. Uh, I have a bulk storage facility and uh, trucking terminal located in White River Junction, Vermont, and an ancillary business located in North Thetford, Vermont. Um, so I'm not a, a voter in the state of Vermont, um, but I am a taxpayer. And um, as a business entrepreneur, um, <clears throat> I have to evaluate the cost of goods and uh, the expense of running my business on a regular basis. And uh, I, it's been my testimony in the past and my, my testimony again here today that uh, out of the several, I operate in several states. So my, my trucking business, I haul all of my own uh, oil and propane and uh, my trucking business uh, extends to um, New York State, Massachusetts, Maine uh, and, and Vermont. So I, I travel across four different states um, that, that creates a tax liability and a regulatory obligation in four different states. So I have some experience in, in different uh, jurisdictions and municipalities. I will tell you that hands down Vermont is uh, among the most difficult and most expensive for me to operate my business in. Um, when I've been asked in the past, what can the Vermont legislature do to help me? Uh, the first thing I've always said is make it more affordable to do business in your state. Um, in, in full disclosure, uh, I purchased the business in Vermont uh, in 2009. I subsequently closed that business because the cost structure that we use for our uh, parent company would not support um, keeping a business in Vermont open. That displaced employees uh, and has created vacant real estate. Um, it's not something I'm proud of, but it is, uh, it's what I'm here to talk to you about today is confronting the reality of uh, how I run my business and how, how the, what the impact of running my business in Vermont is to, to me. Uh, there are three things, three points that I'd like to make today, and I'm, I'm prepared to answer questions and speak uh, at length within my time, of course. Uh, one is, uh, point one is the, what's happening in the energy space, uh, in not only in Vermont, but everywhere in the residential thermal space. Um, you know, the second thing is the consequence, the intended or otherwise, of S, uh, S5 becoming a law. Uh, and then finally, uh, the, the, what you've heard from my colleagues here in the room is the nature of the workforce and uh, the challenges, the headwind that we all face um, in order to uh, reach our mutual goal 
And I will concede that our mutual goal is to be good stewards of the environment, to care for uh, the land that we share. Vermont's natural resources are unmatched. It's a beautiful state. It is a beautiful place. And I take very seriously the obligation that we have to uh, protect, preserve, and preserve those uh, resources. Um, so <clears throat> for, for starters, um, and I, I'm going to give you a little more background uh, since I, I have more time than I originally uh, prepared for. Um, when I got into the uh, heating business, I, I didn't, it wasn't a generational business for me. It wasn't my choice. Um, my father-in-law inspired me to get gainful employment. And the first job I took was with a uh, oil marketing company headquartered out of the state of Maine. Uh, I learned um, the, the residential heating and delivery business at that company. I became a licensed oil burner technician, a class B CDL delivery driver at that company. I went on to manage various departments and built built a, a, a base career there. Um, I then got recruited by a, a refiner headquartered in Canada and was responsible for developing multiple business lines in the state of Maine for that company. Um, it's great for my career, not great for my family. Um, and I made the decision when my kids were young to divorce myself from the rat race. And I, I moved to New Hampshire, uh, to the Upper Valley area and became the general manager for a small family owned business uh, where I sort of fell in love with um, what, what I do today, which is uh, standing in front of customers, delivering product, advising people on uh, how to maximize efficiency and economies inside their home. Uh, I still drive the truck. I still do service work. Uh, but my company that I started in 2006 with my business partner with one oil delivery truck has grown from two guys, a truck and a phone to a full service HVAC mechanical company with 90 employees. Um, we deliver millions of gallons of fossil fuel and uh, do um, hundreds of uh, heat pumps. We have a huge appetite for alternate energy. We work in the photovoltaic solar space. We work in uh, cold climate heat pump, hybrid electric hot water heaters, uh, and we install geothermal systems. So I have uh, more than 10 years of experience in the mechanical side of the business alongside the trucking logistics and delivery business as well. Having said that, I'd like to share with you a little bit about what's happening uh, or what's been happening over the last 10 to 15 years in the residential energy space. The energy sector has been transitioning without you. It's been transitioning naturally because the people that we work for, our customers are requiring it. Um, there is an appetite in the residential heating community to get away from the, vol the price volatility of heating oil and to diversify energy products inside of people's homes. Um, we're confronted, small and large, we're confronted with one option. We can, we can dig in and, and do what we've done uh, and, and fight to deliver the you know, conventional gallon and, and make a living on that, which is getting harder and harder. Or like the three of us that have testified today, you can adapt and diversify your company. We've done that for a variety of reasons. The, the big driver for me personally has been, I've been asked to by my customers. The smartest thing that I ever do is listen to the people that pay me. And they've been asking me for years to help them find a way to divorce themselves from the price volatility of heating. <laughs> the two biggest growth areas of my company right now are delivering propane gas and installing cold climate heat pumps. My current schedule in the service department for installation end of June. I checked this morning before I left our schedule for my three full-time sales guys. 60% of what they're doing right now is related to a cold climate heat pump or hybrid electric water heater or photovoltaic. Uh, and that's consuming more and more resources for a growing service company. But um, in a minute, I'll address a little bit of the expense associated with funding and developing a workforce uh, to meet the existing demand for, uh, again, these are consumers. 50% uh, of my footprint is in the state of Vermont. 50% is in New Hampshire. So the, we're, we're working on both sides of the border across every possible economic spectrum to help people uh, install uh, cold climate heat pumps and, and other uh, devices uh, to maximize efficiency, to make their uh, heating footprint more diverse and um, more affordable. It's, it's, uh, it's a tall order. Uh, the second thing I really wanna get into is the, uh, the consequence uh, intended or otherwise of the um, of S5. 
Um, as I said before, this will be the third time I've spoken in opposition to uh, S5. I'm, I'm not a fan of uh, further regulating our industry or of trying to create a, a credit scheme that creates an incentive that I believe to already be in place. As I said, 60% of the installation portfolio uh, at my company right now is in what we call the clean energy space not because of an incentive, not because of fear of tax, not because fear of an apocalypse, because it's good, uh, it's good practice. It's what consumers want. Um, and it, it, as an entrepreneur, it makes really good sense for us to move in that direction, not exclusively, but alongside uh, our, our core business. Um, as far as consequence is concerned, <clears throat> I will tell you that a year ago, I offered different, very different uh, testimony. I was better prepared. I did more research. I had bullet points that were scripted. Uh, and I felt like I was engaging in a uh, political discussion, I guess, for lack of a better uh, way of explaining it. Over the last year, what I've done is using compromise, common sense, and the confrontation of my reality. To say, okay, what, what am I, where, where am I going to really end up? What's really happening? Which is frankly what, what, what these guys and, and I do every day. We have to confront our reality and we have to take a common sense approach and compromise in an employment relationship when you own a business isn't an option. It's necessary or you don't move forward. Uh, you don't hire employees. You don't you know, meet demands. So using a foundation of compromise, common sense and uh, confronting my reality I embarked on a, a, a one-year effort to engage the, this conversation, not from my perspective, but from the perspective of those that support it. And I read and studied, even I had a conversation with Matt one day, and I don't remember what the comment was, but Matt said, you're actually watching the, the testimony. And he said, are, are you crazy? And I said, I, I, I might be. I think you have to be a little bit crazy. Uh, to, to operate, you know, to, to, to depend, you know, solely on your, your own resources and run a business and, and navigate, you know, the challenges that we confront every day. It takes a little bit of craziness, right? So yeah, but I said, I want to know, I want to know why, I want to know what's behind it. I want to, I want to expose the things that uh, I'm suspicious of, and I want to see if I can educate and learn myself. And uh, oh yeah, I, I, I have, uh, I have educated myself. I've learned a lot. I've also been horribly offended and sometimes vilified um, because I don't always agree. And, um, it's a little bit troublesome to me because I don't, that doesn't apply to me in my daily life and my business. Um, you might think as a business owner, it's my way or the highway, or I always get to do what I want. Nothing could be further from the truth. I think that's the recipe for disaster. It takes, you got to adapt. You got to compromise. You got to flex, uh, you got to give in. And I think what I've been doing for the last year makes a lot of sense. So I reached out to some of the members of the Senate committee that I testified in front of, and I said, you know, I, I've tried to become a student of, uh, I've done independent research on, on the five members of that committee. I've gone to their websites, I've read their commentary, I've watched interviews that they've given. And so I, I offered a letter and I, I sent it to, there's one Senator in particular that lives in the area that I service. And I invited that individual to my business. And I said, uh, she's willing and we haven't been able to sort of work out the logistics yet. But I said, I'm willing to engage you in a conversation because I truly want to understand your perspective. I may not agree with it, but I'm willing to listen. Are you? Um, and, and I think that she is, but I can tell you that the sense I've gotten not from you folks, and I don't mean any disrespect, but the sense I've got from the my prior testimony and the engagement that I've extended to <coughs> evaluating S5 and trying to think objectively about it is that there is not a lot of compromise, common sense, or uh, folks on the regulatory side of this equation willing to confront the reality. So let me talk a little bit about the reality, if, if I may, because I, I, I could be wrong. And as I said, I don't mean to offend anybody. <clears throat> Here's the reality. I don't believe that making public statements that we have to or we are going to get rid of fossil fuel is responsible. I don't think that it's good public policy. I think that compromise and an all of the above approach is more rational, more level-headed, 
and more palatable to the people that pay taxes and live in the state of Vermont. And I know that because I ask them all the time. And as some of my um, friends here have, have already testified, I'm frustrated that your constituents are largely unaware of what's happening. And I know that um, our industry is organizing to educate them. And I just listened to Matt, and I've, I've listened to most of his uh, testimony. Um, Matt just gave you nine points. And Matt has uh, Matt does a great job. Um, a, I can tell you that uh, as a member of his organization, I feel listened to by Matt. And Matt impresses on me that he works in your orbit and he speaks your language. He's really the guy uh, to listen to. So I'm, I'm asking you to please listen intently to what he's telling you. Uh, I think Matt takes a fair and balanced approach to this. I support that. Um, I may say it differently because I'm, I'm not familiar or comfortable in your orbit. I don't do what you do, but I want you to be aware of the, uh, of the impact that it potentially has on my business. So to be more specific, let's talk about um, if we, first of all, we are already seeing a massive decline. I can't quantify it, but you can because every company that sells fossil fuel in your state is required by law to report it in quantity <laughs> monthly and annually. Um, the EPA knows every gallon and every storage tank that exists in your state. So you can quantify this uh, and, and check the facts. And I, I don't want to uh, split hairs, but what I can tell you from my 31 years in the fossil fuel industry, it is not the same industry that I entered uh, in the early 90s, that it is highly, highly engaged in the um, environmental discussion and debate. It's motivated, adequately motivated to uh, eliminate emissions and to create economies of scale and efficiencies. And we have very, very solid examples of exactly how to do that. Those are the questions you should be asking us and the, the work that we should be doing between the private sector and the business owners and the regulatory community is where the rubber meets the road. Figuratively and literally, how to reduce emissions. We're experts on how to do that. We do it every day. The guys that are sitting to my right and left and, and beyond that, the people that work in this industry, those of us that are engaging uh, cold climate heat pumps because it's good business are displacing gallons that we would otherwise deliver to the same number of people, or in some cases to a declining population. Although I will tell you in the area that I service, we've seen a little bit of a population boom since the pandemic. Uh, in areas like Woodstock, Vermont, Beachy, Vermont, uh, what used to be seasonal, uh, occasionally occupied homes are now full-time residences, and they are full of <coughs> people uh, that are in very, very engaging, by the way, in the conversation that we're having. So here's, here's a technical argument that I want to make about cold climate heat pumps. A, you can't do it properly without years of training. This is not a YouTube video. This is not a, a, a vendor sponsored one day training event. This is not, I've been 31 years in the service business. Okay. You don't, you don't just take, take a guy that that's, can, can tune up an oil burner. Okay. Or a guy that can set a propane tank and connect a high pressure propane line, not a transferable skill. Okay. As a business owner that started with two employees, I've built a company to over 80, 24 of them have less than two years of experience at my company. I know how to build a workforce. I also know how, know how much it costs. And the cost, when you evaluate the labor expense, it's not just where do we find people, it's once we do, how do we pay for the years of training, tooling, technology, classroom, field experience it takes before we are in the reputation business, okay? I, I'm not going to let we, some of these guys put their names on their business. All of us, at the end of the day, put our name on the check that we send to you guys once a month, right? If you're going to cash those checks, you should listen to what I'm saying. The workforce that we develop, cannot you cannot just release them into someone's basement. We assume the liability for the outcome of that. There is less and less uh, support, help, even for things as simple as, a, as an oil tank. It, we, we don't share liability. We accept it. We own it. The second we walk into your home, whether it's two o'clock in the morning, Sunday afternoon, Christmas morning, those are the hours that we work. 
The second we show up, we are responsible for not only the integrity of the home, the safety of the home, but the relative safety or not of the appliance that we're now, or the performance of the appliance that we're installing. One of my colleagues brought this point up. Cold climate heat pumps appear to be a panacea. They are not magic. They are wonderful. And I sell lots of them. And today you can buy an Arctic series cold climate high performance heat pump that is effective and will make heat below zero. It's very new. I have cold climate heat pumps that are in my house. There's two of them. They were installed 10 years ago. I shut them off in the wintertime because the performance coefficient stops at 35 degrees Fahrenheit. They're 10 years old. Today, that performance coefficient goes much lower. However, here's a question I ask homeowners all the time. Do you consider 30% efficient? No one has ever said, that seems great. I love 30% efficient. Well, that's the efficiency that you're getting on the best cold climate heat pump as the temperature drops below zero. That's it. Running full speed, running full time, trying to overcome something as simple as a 9,000 or a 12,000 BTU heat load. That's basically what it takes to heat this room. 30% efficient if it's cold outside. And if you have a house that's bigger than this room, you can't do it with one of them. I just want to sure so that folks have time to ask you questions. Of course, about five minutes. Left. Okay, perfect. I'll, I'll uh, I've almost said everything I want to say. Um, so more on uh, uh, heat pumps and hybrid water heaters. Uh, someone mentioned the electric panel. Um, again, with a even with a skilled workforce, you don't just let anybody install a two hundred and thirty volt circuit in someone's house. Additionally, and alongside that. A large percentage of the homes located in Vermont don't have an entrance a hundred, greater than 100 amp, 200 amp or higher that's rated to install that equipment to begin with. You may be able to install, install one, but as soon as you try to ramp up the electric footprint of most homes, I can tell you that around 40% of the heat pump installations that my company does in the state of Vermont require a panel service upgrade. And, and there's incentives for that. So someone has said, well, okay, we're going to have to create some level of incentive. You can incentivize this transition to zero. You can make it free. Here's my, here's my big finish. And if you do that, my company can't meet the demand. Can't. I've been asked by uh, a major manufacturer that wants to do a, a, a micro install uh, a microgrid install in Vermont, if we have labor to supplement it because they're, they're supplying uh, trade professionals from Massachusetts to do it. And I said, no, I would, I, would be, I would be cutting off the existing and potential new customers that I can service in Vermont that have smaller scale residential needs and dedicating resources to one project. It would, someone said in uh, an earlier uh, hearing that I listened to uh, from the state of Vermont that we would need 6,000 new trade professionals to meet the electrification of the thermal <clears throat> sector. Um, I, I, I would argue that I can't find six of them. Um, you know, it's professional truck drivers and it's trade professionals and a little economics on the trade professionals. I did the math uh, several months ago. It's, it cost me real numbers around $125,000 over three years in training, tooling and technology before I can have an individual install a cold climate heat pump that's working in a panel, getting the EPA certification, handling the uh, very, very hazardous uh, refrigerant properly and installing and commissioning the system. So we don't just let anyone drill a hole through the, through the wall of your home and handle uh, our, our 410A or there's new refrigerations coming. Uh, and one more little quick point, the, the technology, the innovation that is supporting this transition already, not static. It's not static. It's not something that we can all say to our industry. I've done it. I have friends and colleagues in this business. I'm crap. I'm going to sell heat pumps. And I go, great. I can sell heat pumps. But if I want to help sell heat pumps today, that's a different proposition than selling heat pumps five years from now. New certification for new refrigeration that's coming in 2023. There's new technology, there's new installation techniques, there's new manufacturers that are coming online. You can't do this properly without a profound 
and very expensive training effort. Take the $1.7 million. Here's a, here's a recommendation. $1.7 million that you're going to put into consultants. When I worked for the big guys, for the refiners, I worked with consultants. I remember this one guy was brilliant. He worked for the McKinsey company. And I said, how do we solve this problem? And he said, just tell me what you want for the answer. And we'll create the data to support it. That's my experience with consultants. So here's my recommendation. I'm not suggesting that they're all bad and they're necessary. Take the $1.7 million and invest it in the development of the trade and, and uh, uh, in the labor pool in this state. We will not let you down. We'll employ them. We'll pay them well. And we'll help you transition on terms that make sense. Not with a fictitious deadline that's, that's supported and, and benchmarked by fear. Again, without compromise, common sense, and confronting our reality, it's not going to happen anyway. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you for your testimony. My pleasure. Representative Smith. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, it sounds to me like you don't, you don't feel that we need S5 because you've got people right now in, you know, that you're installing for and asking for improvements in uh, the technology that they're for heating right now. <clears throat> so this bill seems unnecessary to you. Am I reading that right? Correct. Short answer, it's, it's already happening and I can't meet the existing demand. So, so the public is very interested in conserving energy on their own without being ordered to do it. Definitely. With few exception. Yeah. Almost. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're, we're building a business on it. Thank you. Representative Pat. Uh, <clears throat> question for you, but maybe also some of the other uh, uh, people who've testified. I've heard uh, everyone talking a lot about um, uh, heat pumps. I haven't heard anything about um, uh, advanced wood heat. Uh, systems, and I'm, I'm wondering. I, I mean, I, I, uh, I um, uh, for a homeowner who, this is my example, uh, whose home was built with either a, uh, a distribution system for a furnace or a boiler, yep. it might make sense to have a pellet boiler uh, ra rather than going with with heat pumps. And I and I buy my uh, bulk. Tell us from a fuel dealer. Yeah. Uh, so I'm just wondering if anyone wants to add, add anything about that. Yeah, so I, I actually grew up in a house heated entirely by wood. I, I I credit my mom and dad for for pushing me toward this business because I have split it, carried it, cut it. <laughs> now I turn up a thermostat. And I'm content. But uh, I also am a consumer of wood heat, and I think wood heat, especially in New England. I, I grew up in Maine. I live in New Hampshire for 22 years now. I, I love wood heat. It's great. Um, <clears throat> There's, there's a technical argument uh, against the uh, fuel density and the return that you get from e even the best uh, wood heat. So it, it, it's a conversation that we should have. It's not, I, I don't favor a singular solution. Um, I, I tend to talk a lot about cold climate heat pumps and that emerging technology because it's, it's, it's very, very good, uh, but it's, it's not the singular solution that many people think that it is. Um, I'm in the wood business. Um, it's not huge for us, but we, uh, I think for any, any of us that are adapting our uh, business plan, uh, pellets are, are on the radar. Uh, cordwood is even on the radar. I just got back from a show and my business partner and I were looking almost exclusively at new high efficiency, uh, both electric and wood uh, central heating systems to see uh, how practical it is to you know move that in to the discussion, but it's, I will tell you this, it's not inexpensive to do it from a central perspective and it's very, very laborious. So it takes a segment of the population. When I was a kid, my parents, I think would tell you, wood heat is great because we have an onboard, we feed the wood processor that heats the house. And if, in my, if you didn't get up on your shift and heat my house growing up, it was a bad day for everybody. So I, I learned how to work and I learned that responsibility from, from a dairy farm and from a, a wood stove. I'm channeling my father now, but it, there are, there are lots of people that live in the state of Vermont that simply can't, my, my father-in-law, who was a Mainer born and born and raised was lugging uh, 20 pound pails of wood pellets from his basement to his uh, newly installed uh, pellet stove in rural Maine in Machias, Maine. Well, in 2008, when the last oil spike occurred, and my wife was saying, can't you just 
take one of the trucks home and uh anyway but there are it's just not an option for someone to for some people it is but it's not a it's not a singular solution Right. Thank you for your testimony. My pleasure. Um, members, we're going to take a very much. five My minute pleasure. break. Thank you. We're going to reconvene with our legislative council. Right. We're going to reconvene our meeting and continue and hopefully finish our walkthrough of S5 with our legislative council, Ellen Tchaikovsky. Welcome back, Ellen. Good morning. Ellen Tchaikovsky, Office of Legislative Council. I am here on S5 as passed by the Senate. Can someone remind me exactly where we are? <laughs> page 27. Excellent. Top of page 27. All right. Uh, so we've covered some significant ground so far. Uh, so these are going to be the last handful of statutory sections, and then we'll get into the rulemaking process um, and what that will entail. On page 27, section 8128 establishes the Clean Heat Standard Technical Advisory Group. Um, this is largely unchanged from last year's bill, um, and there have already been a couple of mentions of the technical advisory group in the text, but this is really going to flesh out what they're going to do and then who this group will be made up of. So on page 27, the commission shall establish the Clean Heat Standard Technical Advisory Group, or the TAG, to assist the commission in the ongoing management of the Clean Heat Standard. Its duties shall include establishing and revising the life cycle carbon dioxide equivalent emissions accounting methodology to be used to determine each of the obligated parties annual requirement uh, pursuant to 8124A2. Establishing and revising the clean heat credit value for different clean heat measures. Periodically assessing and reporting to the commission on the sustainability of the production of clean heat measures by considering factors including greenhouse gas emissions, carbon sequestration and storage, human health, land use changes, ecological and biodiversity impacts, groundwater and surface water impacts, air, water, and soil pollution, and impacts on food costs. Setting the expected life length of clean heat measures for the purpose of calculating clean heat, uh, calculating credit amounts, Establishing credit values for each year over a clean heat measure's expected life, including adjustments to account for increasing interactions between clean heat measures over time so as not to double count emission reductions. On to page 28. Facilitating the program's coordination with other energy programs. Oh, yes. Sorry. Yes. Uh, on number five. Mm -hmm. Uh, can you just explain that a bit more? Sure. Yeah. So, and so broadly, the, the list that I've read so far, there's a lot of math that is going to need to be done, um, formulas that are need to be set to um, establish these baseline emission reductions that clean heat measures will lead to. Um, and so uh, down in number five, I made mention of this the other day, as a home, uh, becomes more weatherized, more efficient, as more clean heat measures are added to a single home, each uh, upgrade will lead to less emission reductions because the emissions have already been reduced. So uh, if a home is weatherized, the emissions will go down. And then if a heat pump is added, the emissions will go down, but less than just a standard heat pump because the house is already has lower emissions. So this is something that the clean heat um, group need, the tag needs to look at is increasing interactions between clean heat measures um, so that, because uh, basically what they're gonna have to establish initially is the, the schedule and how much on average each clean heat measure is going to gain in terms of emission reductions. But when you combine them, you don't wanna double count so we've got to address the combined amounts and how much emissions are reduced. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. So on page 28, number seven, calculating the impact of the cost of clean heat credits and the cost savings associated with delivered clean heat measures on per unit heating fuel prices. So in addition to looking at 
um, what emission reductions clean heat measures are going to lead to. They're also going to look at the price of these things and how that's going to impact the price of heating fuel. Number eight, coordinating with the Agency of Natural Resources to ensure that greenhouse gas emissions reductions achieved under another sector through the uh, implementation of the clean heat standard are not double counted in the greenhouse gas emissions inventory <coughs> forecast. Nine, advising the commission on the periodic assessment and revisions, uh, a revision requirement established in 8124A3 of this chapter and any other matters referred to the tag by the commission. So uh, we'll get to it more in a minute, but there's, so we're setting up sort of a three-tiered system here. Um, and then on the next page, we'll discuss, first what's gonna happen is the PUC is gonna hire a, a third party consultant to do a lot of the upfront math with the GREET model and the analysis that needs to be done on how to calculate emission reductions. The TAG is going to review that work and then use it to create the emission schedule um, on what um, every fuel type, what the emissions that each fuel type results in and then what clean heat measures, um, what each of them reduce in emissions. Uh, and then that work is then supervised also by the PUC who has the ability to override these decisions. But it's creating a, a group, this tag is a group of experts. They have to have some expertise in this, this um, calculation work um, who can advise the PUC and assist them because this is a pretty math heavy subject and it will have a lot of upfront work and then there will be less work over time but they will also evaluate newer technologies that come online that could be eligible to become clean heat credits um, in the future as well. So there will be a lot of work up front for this group and then over time, less work, but they will still be part of the clean heat standard program. Representative Tory. Just a question for you about the math. Is it the same kind of math that you have to do with emissions? Like, is this kind of setting the ground for what we could eventually do. Yes. Um, so uh, no other state in the country has a clean heat standard. However, this program is modeled off of the clean fuels program that Oregon, Washington, and California currently okay. use. And so it has similar framework to that. Um, and so the GREET model, which, which I mentioned last week, that is the, the analysis that they use for transportation fuels. Um, this system using the TAG and the independent consultant will evaluate that model and transform it to use it for thermal sector fuels. And so um, if at some point you wanna do something like this for transportation fuels, you could, you could look uh, more closely at the other state programs though, because there is actually like existing some programs, yeah. So this program is a little bit of a hybrid of the renewable energy standard and that we have in Vermont and the programs that are in other states for, for transportation fuels. Uh, Representative Clifford. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, going back to uh, number eight on page 28, mm -hmm. Vermont Greenhouse Gas Emissions Inventory. You, I don't know, can you tell me what that is? Yeah, so last week you heard from Colin Smythe. Right. And so a &R has been producing this greenhouse gas inventory for the last five or maybe more than five years. And that is what is used to um, keep track of how many emissions there are in the state yearly as well, and then break it down by sector. Um, so that's where we get a lot of the basis of this bill from in knowing that approximately 34% of our statewide emissions come from the building sector. Um, and so you did hear from Colin last week. I think he provided you um, some of the recent data. Um, they are gonna be coming out with the most recent greenhouse gas inventory. I think they said April or May. Um, so they, so it's a, it has a lag time on the report. So it's a couple of years behind. So they're only up to 2019 at this point. But they do gather a lot of different data sources using both the federal um, uh, sources as well as in-state sources to calculate the emissions produced in the state and which sectors they come from. Thank you very much. Yeah. All right, so on page 28B, members of the TAG shall be appointed by the commission and shall include the Department of Public Service, the Agency of Natural Resources, 
and parties who have or whose representatives have expertise in one or more of the following areas. Technical and analytical expertise in measuring life cycle greenhouse gas emissions, energy modeling and data analysis, clean heat measures and energy technologies, sustainability and non-greenhouse gas emissions strategies designed to reduce and avoid impacts to the environment, delivery of heating fuels, land use changes, deforestation, and climate change mitigation policy and law. The commission shall accept and review motions to join the tag from interested parties who have or whose representatives have expertise in one or more of the areas listed in this subsection. On to page 29, members who are not otherwise compensated by their employer shall be entitled to per diem compensation and reimbursement for expenses under 32 BSA 1010. Representative Sibelia. So just uh, clarifying in this sci highly scientific technical advisory group, um, the expertise that we're seeking, is it possible that we would see um, someone from the fossil fuel industry um, on here? It seems like it is to me. Yes, so if you look at the third line from the bottom, it does include having expertise in delivery of heating fuels. So, um, and I think that will potentially be really relevant to when they look at, they're supposed to specifically be looking at heating fuel prices. So yes, um, I, I think a member from that industry could be included. And as I read this, uh, the commission is appointing this technical advisory group. I don't see a limit on what the commission can do. So it gives them flexibility for bringing in the experts that they need without limit. Correct. There isn't a set number of people and there aren't set term limits. Thank you. Yeah. So on page 29, subsection C, the commission shall hire a third party consultant responsible for developing clean heat measure characterizations and relevant assumptions, including CO2E life cycle emissions analyses. The tag shall provide input and feedback on the consultant's work. The commission may use appropriated funds to hire a consultant. Emissions analyses and associated assumptions developed by the consultant shall be reviewed and approved annually by the commission. In reviewing the consultant's work, the commission shall provide a public comment period on the work. The commission may approve or adjust the consultant's work as it deems necessary based on its review and the public comments received. So this is the, the system I was just mentioning. So um, there will be an independent consultant doing a lot of the upfront heavy lifting on the math. The TAG and the PUC are going to review the work. They're going to potentially make changes to the consultant's work. Um, then the TAG is going to use this emissions um, uh, characterizations and assumptions to do further uh, analyses based on the types of fuel and the emissions uh, reductions that can be achieved in the different clean heat measures. Uh, and then the PUC does have fi final say over all of this work as well. And there is public comment period on the analyses themselves, as mentioned here in D. So um, it won't be in a black box. <laughs> Section 8129 establishes the Clean Heat Standard Equity Advisory Group. Um, like last year's bill, this I think this is nearly identical to last year's bill as well. Um, so the commission shall establish the Clean Heat Standard Equity Advisory Group to assist the commission in developing and implementing the Clean Heat Standard in a manner that ensures an equitable share of clean heat measures are delivered to Vermonters with low income and moderate income, and that Vermonters with low income and moderate income who are not early participants in clean heat measures are not negatively impacted in their ability to afford heating fuel. Its duties shall include, onto page 30, providing feedback to the commission on strategies for engaging Vermonters with low income and moderate income in the public process for developing the clean heat standard program. So I'll stop here. So this is um, initially as part of the public engagement phase. So the, the group is supposed to weigh in on how to engage um, the Vermonters with low income and moderate income so that they're um, able to participate and weigh in. 
Um, there's a there's language at the end of the bill that specifically um, directs the PUC to um, invite anyone that the equity advisor group wants to see participating um, so that they can um, directly invite people that the equity advisory group think are necessary to the conversation. Representative Stebbins. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, just a reminder, um, Jay. Yeah, I wrote Green, that too. Yeah, yeah. had yeah. said, is so, this needed? So many groups, maybe you could figure out a different way to do yeah. this. Yes, they, did, they did also testify in the Senate that you could also consider maybe making this a time limited group. Um, so the tag is a perpetual group. Um, this group, is, as it will read through the rest of this, has a lot of upfront work and how, how we will engage um, with low income Vermonters uh, and those with high energy burdens, as well as um, making sure that there are aspects of the program that are helpful and protective of them. Um, but you may want to consider if this group will sunset in five years or seven years after the program has already got um, established and running. Uh, so number two, the group shall uh, support the commission in assessing whether customers are equitably served by clean heat measures and how to increase equity. Identifying actions needed to provide customers with low income and moderate income with better service and to mitigate the fuel price impacts calculated in 8128 of this title. Recommending any additional programs incentives or funding needed to support customers with low income and moderate income and organizations that provide social services to Vermonters in affording heating fuel and other heating expenses. Providing feedback to the commission on the impact of the clean heat standard on the experiences with Vermonters, of the experience of Vermonters with low income and moderate income and providing information to the commission on the challenges renters face in equitably accessing clean heat measures and recommendations to ensure that renters have equitable access to clean heat measures. On to page 31, the clean heat standard equity advisory group shall consist of up to 10 members appointed by the, the PUC and at a minimum shall include at least one representative from each of the following groups. The Department of Public Service, the Department of Children and Families Office of Economic Opportunity, Community Action Agencies, the Efficiency Vermont, individuals with socioeconomically, racially, and geographically diverse backgrounds, renters, renter, rental property owners, Vermont Housing <coughs> Finance Agency, and a member of the Vermont Fuel, Fuel Dealers Association. Members who are not otherwise compensated by their employer shall be entitled to per, per diem compensation and reimbursement for expenses under 32 BSA 1010. All right. That is the primary main sections of the statute. Now we're going to get into some of the details. Um, so on page 31, section 31, uh, 8130 is the severability section. This is fairly, this is boilerplate language. Um, if any provision of this chapter or its application to any person or circumstance is held invalid or in violation of the constitution or laws of the United States or in violation of the constitution or laws of Vermont, the invalidity or the violation shall not affect other provisions of this chapter that can be given effect without the invalid provision or application and to this end, the provisions of the chapter are severable. So 8131 uh, is the rulemaking authority section. This section was added in the Senate Appropriations Amendment. The language in this section is part of what is known as the check back provision. <clears throat> so at the bottom of page 31, Notwithstanding any other provision of law to the contrary, the commission shall not file proposed rules with the Secretary of State or issue any orders implementing the Clean Heat Standard without specific authorization enacted by the General Assembly. This is nearly identical to what was passed last year in H715. What it does is it overrides all of the prior sections um, in that the PUC cannot issue any orders and it cannot adopt final rules. So it will allow them to draft proposed rules, which we'll talk about in a moment, are gonna to come to the General Assembly. 
um, but it can't issue any orders uh, without specific authorization enacted by the General Assembly. <clears throat> enacted is a word with legal implications. Enacted means passed into law. Passed into law means uh, passed by both houses of the General Assembly and sent to the governor uh, under the presentment clause. Uh, so it will be a bill uh, and that will need to have specific authorization. <clears throat> and so we'll talk about this a little bit more um, in the last section, but in order for any rules or orders to become effective, uh, that would implement the clean heat standard, the General Assembly will need to give the PUC approval to do so in the form of legislation. So I have a question about that. Um, does that mean that, like, so they would have the rules and we would codify the actual rules or would we codify the intent of those rules? So um, you won't need to codify them. Uh, and there's more, there is a more details on this later, uh, you will need to pass, pass specific authorization. And so uh, that one way that that would happen is you could have a very simple bill that would repeal this small section of law. Because um, I think of this section as the roadblock um, and it does conflict with the earlier sections of the bill that give the PUC authority to issue orders and rules. Um, and so I do think this language will need to be repealed at some point if the General Assembly wants the PUC to do those things. So uh, the PUC, the, the rules, and we'll talk about this a little bit more, but the rules are going to come to the General Assembly for review. Um, the General Assembly, uh, th those rules need to... Uh, be in, uh, they need to confirm, confirm, they need to be legal under the law in this bill. And so if the General Assembly didn't like something that were in the rules, the P you could amend the statute, which would then require the rules to be um, amended to conform to the statute. Um, you could potentially seek to codify the clean heat standard rules in statute and that would look something like the fish and wildlife rules they're in appendix 10 um, um, and so that's one of the only other places in statute where you have rules in the green books you could choose to do that um, but you wouldn't need to because there is a process in here um, where the rules will need to go to LCAR anyways. And so you will have the ability to change the rules when they come to the General Assembly, either by directing the PUC to change them or modifying the statute so that the rules conflict with them. Um, or you could have LCAR tell them to do that because that is one of the processes that LCAR uses is asking agencies to amend their rules um, to... to uh, be in alignment with legislative intent. So you will have a few different options, but you will need to pass something. You will not be able to do a resolution. That would, not, that would be unconstitutional um, because there is a legal statute here that provides a roadblock to the adoption of rules or orders. Thank you. Um, Representative Sibelia, then Tori, then Clifford. So enact. Uh, does the governor have to sign in order for... It needs to be presented to the governor, and then the governor has his usual options of signing, letting become without signature, or veto, at which point you would have the opportunity to override a veto. So it would be a standard bill like you normally do. So we could enact it and then have a third... Okay. <laughs> Representative Tory. I have a really quick question. Just remind me what year it is. January 2025. What's the question? When yeah. the rules were going to come to the General Assembly. Yeah. Representative Clifford. Thank you, Madam Chair. So the PUC, okay, they cannot issue rules or orders without coming back to legislature. However, they can set uh, rates and um, for credits? Arguably, no. So this is something I did want to raise. Um, the, this language, I think, prohibits any uh, definitive action by the PUC. Um, they could publish draft 
rules, but they couldn't publish anything binding. Um, so if, and so as we talked about last week in 8126, there is authority for the PUC to issue orders on like discrete parts of the program, like, um, uh, yeah, like setting the credit prices or setting the, the eligible list of measures. Um, you may want to consider if they should have some ability to issue some of the preliminary um, work without with and still preventing them from issuing the final rule. So you may want to consider if you want them to be able to issue any of the sort of preliminary step documents. <clears throat> now they can't do anything without legislative approval. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So that is one difference from last year is that last year there wasn't that provision in 8126 about them being able to issue or early orders in the early stages. Um, and so because that authority is in there now, that I do think this language as it came over from the Senate would prevent those early orders. Um, and so you may want to consider if that's something you want to adjust. So that's the end of the clean heat standard statutory text. On page 32, section four um, relates to the greenhouse gas inventory. <clears throat> so it's amending 10 BSA 582, which is the statute that requires that um, ANR issue, the greenhouse gas inventory. So it's adding new language at the end of this section, which reads, the Secretary of Natural Resources shall include a sensitivity analysis in the greenhouse gas emissions inventory and forecast that measures the life cycle greenhouse gas emissions of liquid, gaseous, and solid biogenic fuels combust in Vermont. Um, so you should probably hear more testimony about this. Um, this a sensitivity analysis is a specific type of analysis that looks at um, what types of variables were used and assumptions that were used in the calculations um, and so it's requiring additional, additional granularity um, in the greenhouse gas emissions inventory and forecast. And I am not an expert on that, those types of calculations, um, but perhaps Jared Duval could explain them to you. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> so section five, or perhaps ANR could as well, mm -hmm. um, and how this would fit into how they're currently doing their math. <clears throat> so section five relates to the tax records. So it's adding new language to 32 VSA 3102, which establishes the tax department's confidentiality. So I think you have heard a little bit about this. Um, if you turn to page 33, so currently, the tax department collects taxes regularly from fuel sellers um, on the heating fuel tax. Uh, that information is currently confidential. Um, earlier in this bill, there is a directive for the tax department to share that information with the PUC um, because that information will be very helpful. Um, so they know the universe of people who are already paying taxes and how many gallons they're paying taxes on. Um, and then that can help establish who are the universe of people who are obligated parties um, and if they are accurately reporting their uh, fuel sold to both the PUC and the tax department. So on page 33, subsection D, the commissioner shall disclose a return or return information. And there's already an existing list of people that are um, allowed to get this information, but it's adding the PUC and the Department of Public Service to this list. So to the PUC and the Department of Public Service for providing information related to the fuel tax imposed under 33 VSA 2503, necessary to administer the clean heat standard established in 30 VSA chapter 94. Oh, Representative Simmons. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, the language <clears throat> that you referred to as a roadblock at the top of page five, mm -hmm. sorry, page 32, um, does that timing line up with this data piece or with, does this data piece like kick in as soon as, you know, assuming that this moves forward, does that data piece move forward on its own and then 
the PUC being able to pass rules, et cetera, is a separate. Are you calling thing. the data piece the sensitivity analysis? No, I'm calling the data piece um, uh, page 33. Oh, the nine. Nine. Yeah. So my question is the new thing that the Senate added in where there has to be a legislative that. approval in January 2025 or whenever. Does this, is that looped into that or does this move forward regardless? No, this is separate. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and because this is creating a directive to the Department of Taxes to share with the PUC. And so the PUC won't need to issue any order. Okay. Um, the one, uh, one example of an order that you may want to consider is um, there, earlier in this bill, there is the first registration deadline for um, companies to register is currently January 31st, 2024. Um, and so I'm not sure if the PUC was initially going to issue an order establishing the form that they were going to need to register on or the that sort of procedural detail. I don't know if they were going to do that by order. So that may be something. But this the, the Department of Taxes needs to share with the PUC is not covered by the roadblock. All right, so section six is the big section with the details about the rules. So page 33, bottom of page 33, section six, public utility commission implementation. <clears throat> A, commencement. On or before October 31st, 2023, the PUC shall commence a proceeding to implement section three, clean heat standard. Um, commence a proceeding is sort of a term of art here. The PUC has their um, their online database where they um, do all of their their work. So they open an invest they open a proceeding or an investigation through that system, and that sort of sets up the the public's ability to access all information related to a specific topic. So on or before October thirty one or August thirty one. They may do it before that. There'll be a public um, database on the PUC's website with all this information. B, facilitator. Uh, the commission may hire a third-party consultant to design and conduct public engagement. The commission may use funds appropriated under this act on hiring the consultant. On to page 34, public engagement process. This is a bit different from last year's bill. It's a little more streamlined. Before commencing rulemaking, the commission shall use the forms of public engagement described in the subsection to inform the design and implementation of the clean heat standard. Any failure by the commission to meet the specific procedural requirements of the section shall not affect the validity of the commission's actions. <clears throat> the commission shall allow any person to register at any time in the commission's online case management system in EPUC as a participant in the clean heat standard proceeding. All members of the equity advisory group shall be made automatic participants in that proceeding. All registered participants in the proceeding, including all members of the equity advisory group, shall receive all notices of public meetings and all notices of opportunity to comment in that proceeding. The commission shall hold at least six public hearings or workshops that shall be recorded and publicly posted on the commission's website or on EPUC. These meetings shall be open to everyone, including all stakeholders, members of the public, and all other potentially affected parties. The commission shall also provide at least three opportunities for the submission of written comments. Any person may submit written comments to the PUC. Um, and so just to stop there, there will be more than, there will likely be more than three opportunities because um, once they open a, a, a proceeding in EPUC, you can submit public comments at any time, but they are anticipating having multiple drafts for people to review. And so that's sort of what we're considering opportunities. <laughs> so there will be any time, at any time you can submit comments generally or at one of the meetings or when they release draft rules, people will be able to respond to them that way. <laughs> um, on to page 35. The commission shall invite organizations and communities recommended by the equity advisory group to participate <clears throat> in the commission's public meetings and opportunities to comment. Advertising, the commission shall use funding appropriated in this act on advertising the public meetings in order to provide notice to a wide variety of segments of the public. Draft proposed rules, 
The commission shall publish draft proposed rules publicly and provide notice of them through the commission's online case management system, EPUC, to the stakeholders in this rulemaking who registered their names and email addresses with the commission through EPUC. The commission shall provide a 30-day public comment period on the draft and accept written comments from, public, from the public and stakeholders. The commission shall consider changes in response to the public comments before filing <laughs> rules with the Secretary of State and the Legislative Committee on Administrative Rules. <clears throat> so, next comes the sort of big part. So, we're going to start, if this bill were to pass this session, before the end of August, they're going to need to start the rulemaking process. They're going to need to have at least six public meetings or workshops. They're gonna set up the online system so that people can submit comments at any time. And all of the hearings will be um, recorded so people can watch them after the fact. They'll need to do some advertising and they can hire a public engagement coordinator to help them design effective public engagement processes. So this is all going to lead up to them submitting final proposed rules to the legislature on January 15, 2025. So on page 35, section F, final rules, on or before January 15, 2025, the commission shall submit to the General Assembly final proposed rules to implement the clean heat standard. The commission shall not file the final proposed rules to the Secretary of State until specific authorization is enacted by the General, General Assembly to do so. Is that also added, that language? Yes. Oh, yes. Yeah, so sorry. F, this section F is also part of the checkback language that was added by Senate Appropriations. And it is nearly identical to last year's bill as well. So on page 36, there are a lot of statutory citations that I do have written down somewhere, but I'm going to. Here they are. Um, I'm going to read through them, but what's this section is going to establish a modified Administrative Procedure Act process. So currently, um, you hopefully have some familiarity with the Administrative Procedure Act, which is rulemaking. Um, it's a pretty formal process with a statute in 3 VSA Chapter 25 setting out um, the steps that an agency need to take in order to adopt a rule. And so this section is going to waive some of those requirements because the rules normally don't come back to the full General Assembly. So it's going to waive some of the required steps because they're actually um, covered by some of the steps you're gonna take anyway. So I will address them so that you're aware of what we're specifically um, getting rid of. One of the big things is that they won't have to go to ICAR, which is the Interagency Committee on Administrative Rules. That's usually one of the first steps. And ICAR prescribes a public engagement strategy. Um, here, we're going to waive that requirement because you are prescribing that public engagement strategy that we just went over on the prior page. So page 36, notwithstanding three VSA sections, 80, uh, 820, 831, 836 through 840 and 841A, upon affirmative authorization enacted by the General Assembly authorizing adoption of rules implementing the clean heat standard, the commission shall file as the final proposed rules, the rules implementing the clean heat standard approved by the General Assembly with the Secretary of State and the Legislative Committee on Administrative Rules pursuant to 3 VSA 841. The filing shall include everything that is required under 3 VSA 838, A, 1 through 5, 8 through 13, 15, and 16, and 841, B1. Do you want me to go through that list now? No? Okay. Um, and so that last part, um, the filing shall still include all the things that are normally required including the economic impact analysis and the environmental impact analysis that is normally covered with rulemaking. Uh, the review, adoption, and effect of the rules implementing the clean heat standard shall be governed by 841C, 842, exclusive of B4, 843, 845, and 846, exclusive of A3. Once adopted and effective, the amendments to the rules implementing the clean heat standard shall be made in accordance with the APA. So once the rules are enacted, 
the regular APA process will um, will go forward in future rulemaking amendments. This is just a temporary one because normally rules don't come to the legislature for full review. <clears throat> and so I would also just mention that there was mention in there that even after the General Assembly approves the rules, they're going to be filed with the Secretary of State, and they all they are still going to go to LCAR, who will review them again. And LCAR has a standard list of um, uh, items that they review, including legislative intent, whether or not it was arbitrary and capricious. Uh, there's a couple more. I don't know if Representative Bodgarts knows them. We are waiving one of them here, which is did they follow ICAR's recommendations on public engagement? Um, but otherwise, LCAR will still be able to review the rules and possibly object if for some reason there's something in the rules that conflict with what's in the statute. <sighs> All right. So G, consultant. The commission may contract with a consultant to assist, to assist with the implementation of 30 VSA 8127, which is establishing the credits and that system. Funding. On or before January 15, 2024, the commission shall report to the General Assembly on suggested revenue streams that may be used or created to fund the commission's administration of the Clean Heat Standard Program. So that's one thing I'll flag. There are no fees or taxes in this bill at all. Um, and so there is an appropriation section that we're going to get to on the next page um, that will fund the initial new um, the initial public outreach work and the new staff, but um, there isn't a dedicated funding source. And so the next year, the PUC is going to report back to the general assembly on how this program could be funded in the future. Uh, on page 37, additionally, there are checkback reports. So on or before Jan uh, February 15th, 2024, and January 15th, 2025, the commission shall submit a written report to and be available to provide oral testimony to the House Committee on Environment and Energy and the Senate Committees on Finance and on Natural Resources and Energy, detailing the efforts undertaken to establish the Clean Heat Standard. The reports shall include, to the extent available, estimates of the impact of the clean heat standard on customers, including impacts on customer rates and fuel bills for participating and non-participating <clears throat> customers, net impacts on total spending on energy for thermal sector end uses, fossil fuel reductions, greenhouse gas emission reductions, and if possible, impact on economic activity and employment. The modeled impact shall estimate high, medium, and low price impacts. The reports shall recommend any legislative action needed to address enforcement or other aspects of the clean heat standard. Representative Sibelia, non-participating customer means? Someone who is opting not to do any clean heat work. Okay. Thank you. Um, and so these, so these are two reports. Uh, well, let me let me finish J and then I'll give an overall uh, what's happening here. So assistance, the Agency of Commerce and Community Development, the Department of Public Service and other state agencies and departments shall assist the commission with economic modeling for the required reports and rulemaking process. So uh, I did provide you initially last week with a timeline based on the specific dates in this report. Um, at some point we can look at it and I will tell you that there are lots of other things that will need to be done that are not on the timeline because they don't have specific dates required. But if this bill were to pass, and there's one more section about appropriations, but um, the PUC will get to work on doing the rulemaking and there are a few dates that they'll have to meet based on this. But one of the first is that next February, next January, they'll need to provide you with um, a suggestion on how this program can be paid for. And then they're going to, in February, have this um, fairly detailed report on economic impacts to customers and then as well as some of the environmental impacts. And so that will be in February. Then there will be another report that comes out when they bring you the rules the following January. So there will be a full se legislative session next year um, where you will have this report an update on where they are in the rulemaking process and what are some of the initial estimates on economic 
So uh, finally, section seven is the appropriations and, and positions section. So section A, the bottom of page 37, the following new positions are created at the Public Utility Commission for the purpose of carrying out this act. On to page 38, one permanent exempt staff attorney, one permanent exempt analyst, and one limited service exempt analyst. Uh, limited service means temporary. The sum of $825,000 is appropriated to the Public Utility Commission from the general fund in fiscal year 2024 for the positions established in subsection A for all of the consultants required in this act and for other additional operating costs required to implement the clean heat standard, including marketing and public outreach for section six of this act. The following new positions are created at the Department of Public Service Act. One permanent exempt staff attorney and two permanent classified program analysts. The sum of $900,000 is appropriated to the Department of Public Service from the general fund in fiscal year 2024 for the positions to retain consultants that may be requ required to support verification and evaluation uh, related to clean heat measures and calculating the credits um, and ver so verifying that the credits uh, have the amount of emission reductions they're required to have for conducting the potential study and for associated operating costs related to implementation of the clean heat standard. Representative Clifford. Thank you, Madam Chair. So just a question on page 38 we're on B, section B. Mm -hmm. um, the general fund, uh, the money to be coming out of the general fund fiscal year 2024. Mm -hmm. Are those positions established and for the selection for all consultants? So does the PUC hire the consultants? Yes. They do. Is Do you know if there's a process that they go through and what that process would be as far as, do they go RFPs? Do they? Um, I think they go RFPs, but I don't know specifically how that works. Okay. They'll be here tomorrow. We can ask them. Okay. Yep. Okay. I'll do that. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Pat. Um, the, uh, from my recollection, uh, th th this is general fund dollars, and I, I don't believe that the PUC or the department, other than this, uh, have uh, general funds appropriated to them. They're just. Uh, yeah, so the, and, and you might want to hear from the PUC about this. Currently, the PUC, I don't believe, gets any general funds. The department, I do think, has a couple of positions yeah, that are funded. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. yes, they are currently funded almost exclusively by the gross receipts tax, which is from the uh, electric utilities. So the so currently, both DPS and the PUC are funded by the industries that they directly regulate. Um, and so that's why there is the requirement in there that next year the PUC is going to report back on how they think this will be funded, uh, because this will be a new, <clears throat> they will be regulating a new sector that they haven't regulated before, and they will probably need to fund um, this work in some way, perhaps from that <clears throat> I just I just add, I mean, it's the fuel gross receipts tax and fees. And fees, yes. Sorry. Representative Smith. Thank you. Uh, could you tell me where in this report does it start addressing uh, Senator Kitchell's amendment? Sure. So Senator Kitchell's amendment is the check back section in statute, which is the 8131 section. And then in the section we just went over, it was subsection F which was on page, at the bottom of page 35. 8131? Yep, which was on page 31. Thank you. Yep. And this bill will take effect on passage. Okay. Thank you, Ellen. That was very helpful. Um, and so I did mention um, you had a brief summary chart. You do have a timeline. 
Uh, I don't think I don't think it's the best timeline because I do think it only acknowledges the specific dates that are required by the act. There's a lot of work that the PUC is going to need to do, including hiring the consultants and then doing the math for these things that are not necessarily specifically addressed on the timeline. Could, could is there a way to add those in, or is it potentially? It's uh, I'm not the best with graphics, but potentially we can talk about that. Okay, great. Um, and then I, what I'd like to do is probably you offered to walk us through that timeline and also the sections of the Administrative Procedure Act. Oh, yes. So at some point, we'll have you back to do those things. Yes. Thanks. Yes. Great. All right. Next up, we're going to welcome Jeff Hand. Welcome, Mr. Hand. Good morning. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Got a presentation to share with you all. Let me just <clears throat> see if I can do that here. <clears throat> yes. John, right there. Is the, um, is the window open back there? Good. A little more, more air. I, I would. Yeah. Feeling a lack of oxygen. Looking around at yawners too. Did it hear me snore yet? Did you? Okay. Can that? Can you all see that? Great. Good morning. Thank you all for having me. Uh, my name is Jeff Hand. I'm an attorney at SRH Law, which was formerly Dunkiel Saunders. Uh, I focus primarily on energy and environmental issues. I've practiced law for about 20 years, uh, represent a wide range of clients. Uh, I want to be clear, I'm here testifying today on my own behalf, not on behalf of any clients. Uh, we were asked a couple of years ago by the Clean Heat Working Group to look at their proposed uh, legislation and consider issues related to federal limitations on state action in this area. Uh, we did that work pro bono. Uh, I'm here testifying just as a citizen and as a, uh, a resource to the committee on some of these more complex federal constitutional issues. So what I'd like to do is walk through very briefly our review of the legislation um, and then save some time for questions from you all related to the proposed language, specifically as it relates to two federal constitutional principles. Um, so as I said, well, I, I wanna start really, it's important when you're talking about federal constitutional principles to think about how they balance with state jurisdictions. So we're gonna start talking about state authority to act in this area. And we'll talk about two federal constitutional principles. I think you heard some from Assistant um, Attorney General Laura Murphy last week or two on similar issues. So they should sound familiar to you, but I'm happy to answer any questions. And then a few thoughts on sort of how this program is designed to meet those limitations. Um, first, starting with general state authority to act in this area, um, as you all likely well know, um, the state exercises within its boundaries the authority of a sovereign. Um, within those powers are what are referred to as police powers. It has the ability to make laws and regulate for the public's health, safety, and well being. Federal courts have recognized consistently that a state's energy policy and regulation of ener energy industry as, uh, are some of the most important functions when we refer to police powers. So clearly within the scope of that state police power. And similarly, it's very well settled um, via a case at the US Supreme Court that states have a legitimate interest in addressing the adverse effects of climate change on their residents. Um, I wanna talk briefly also just about how we currently regulate heating fuels in Vermont is at the broadest level. Um, there are a number of programs that apply to heating fuels that have been passed by this body over the years. Uh, those include, but are not necessarily limited to, sulfur content in heating fuels, licensing fees for the cleanup, uh, uh, petroleum cleanup for bulk heating fuel, uh, tax on heating oil and propane for weatherization initiatives, there's a very comprehensive uh, consumer protection rule passed by the AG related to sales in this area. Um, and there's actually authority, although I don't think it's ever been implemented for a state strategic oil set aside, similar to the federal strategic oil set aside. 
Um, <coughs> one, this is kind of like a pop quiz, but there's one important program that's missing from this list. I don't know if anyone knows what it is off the top of their head. I'm not gonna actually make you take the quiz. <laughs> the one that's not on here is the Global Warming Solutions Act. Um, so it, it, through that program, uh, asked by this body, heating fuel is already technically regulated. The emissions from that fuel is subject to the cap. And so it's important to keep that in mind that as we're working towards those goals already established in legislation for 2025, 2030, 2050, the state will need to meet those re required reductions in some capacity. Uh, and what the Affordable Heating Act does uh, is provides a mechanism for meeting those goals in a structured, in timely manner. Uh, if you don't pursue something like that, which is certainly an option, uh, it leaves the state in a position of likely needing to scramble to implement something later. It may be less structured and maybe less well designed to pass some of the benefits of this kind of program onto individuals who may need more support, low income, moderate Vermonters, uh, who can, can provide, can receive benefits through some of the designs of this program. So just keep in mind that the emissions from these sources are already regulated. And when it comes to reducing uh, emissions, we've made a lot of progress in the electric sector. And so the thermal and transportation side is really where we're going to need to look for a lot of those reductions. Um, all of these, I want to emphasize this, all of these uh, existing statutes apply to voluntary commercial transactions for products that are sold into the state of Vermont. So we're talking about activities that happen within the state boundaries. And that is very important when we get to these two uh, federal doctrines I want to talk about. The first one being the Dormant Commerce Clause. Um, this one is always can be confusing and everyone says, what does dormant mean? Um, but let's start with the Commerce Clause, uh, which provides Congress the authority to regulate commerce with four nations and among se several states. And as the Constitution is written with the Indian tribes. In that express grant of authority to Congress to regulate those issues, there is an implied restriction on states that they cannot act in these areas to unjustifiably discriminate <laughs> against the burden of the flow of articles of commerce and interstate commerce. Um, that is commonly referred to the dormant as the dormant commerce clause, the sort of quiet part of the com commerce clause. The primary concern in that federal constitutional doctrine is to prevent economic protectionism, that is, regulatory mechanisms that are designed to benefit in-state economic interests by burdening out-of-state economic interests. And historically, just to keep in mind, these provisions were added to the U.S. Constitution because of a lot of failed implementation of the Articles of Confederation, Confederation that predated the Constitution, where states had much more authority to act independently without regard to the federal uh, uh, authority. And that led to a lot of conflicts between states at the time. So this was designed to ensure we have an overarching federal theme <clears throat> that protects those interests, but still allows states to act appropriately within their area of jurisdiction. Representative Stevens. Thanks, Madam Chair. Yeah. Um, so like, when did this come about? I mean, before, this, after, in between like this, the Revolutionary War and the Civil Before War? Before the existing constitution, there were other structures of government that were tried um, and that were not successful. And so um, the constitution we have now took into account a lot of those challenges. Um, and that's why we see many provisions, but including the, the Commerce Clause. <clears throat> so specifically, the Commerce Clause addresses, uh, you look at three things. Um, you're focused on, and this is when courts are reviewing state laws for compliance. Does the law discriminate between in-state and out-of-state interests? That discrimination can be on its face. It can say, we only support Vermont products, uh, or it could be implied or um, have the effect of, of discriminating. <clears throat> Second, does the law regulate commerce occurring entirely outside of the state? So not something where the state would have an appropriate interest in, in regulating something that comes into or from the state. And then finally, does, this, does the law impose a burden on interstate commerce that is clearly excessive in relation to the punitive local benefits? This is really a balancing test of whether the goals, the state's goals are 
uh, appropriately implemented in a way that doesn't unreasonably burden interstate commerce. This is often referred to as the Pike test. And typically, if you get through the first two standards, most state laws are upheld under that third standard if they're, if they're appropriately justified by the legislature. So I wanna switch from general principles to kind of how these principles have been applied in similar programs in other states. There are a couple that are worth looking at. Um, the first one is the California Low Carbon Fuel Standard. Um, that sets standards to reduce greenhouse gas emissions attributed to California's fuel market. Uh, fuel blenders are required to keep the average carbon intensity of their product below the standard's annual limits. And they generate credits um, based on being below that standard and can't, there's a market to sell those credits. Importantly, the fuels are evaluated on the life cycle emissions of, the, of each fuel, um, not on the location the fuel comes from. So that program was challenged uh, in uh, mid 2000s. Uh, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals upheld the program in 2013, and they found that it did not unreasonably discriminate did not discriminate against out-of-state interests because the, the, the program was designed to, uh, dis to distinguish between different fuel products based on their carbon intensity, uh, not on their area of production or, or where they come from. And that is a proper exercise of state regulatory authority to address a recognized environmental concern. It's also not, it was not an extraterritorial application. Um, the court here made a clear distinction that California can regulate within the state to address local harms and structure, I want to emphasize this, structure its internal markets in a way that incentivizes firms to produce less harmful products in the state. Um, so because just because out-of-state actors may need to comply with an in-state requirement does not mean it's uh, unconstitutional. Similarly, uh, Oregon has a clean fuels program, which you may have heard about, very similar design to California's program. Um, that was also challenged, uh, and the, Eighth, the Ninth Circuit upheld that program in 2018 on similar grounds. Again, it doesn't discriminate on the basis of origin. There's no discriminatory purpose found if the program is simply to reduce Oregon's contribution to global levels of greenhouse gas emissions and the impacts of those emissions in, in Oregon. Um, and I think it's, it's worth pointing out that one of the things the court looked at in that case is the underlying justification for the program. Is it really about addressing economic concern, or excuse me, environmental concerns? Or is it some sort of hidden protectionist program? And they may look at including things like what legislators are saying about the program. How am I talking about justifying this program to my constituents? So I think it's important when the, this body is considering the program to be very clear as the statute is about what the purpose is uh, for this program. Finally, um, in a slightly different context, um, there was a, a, a challenge to Connecticut's uh, renewable portfolio standard. So as the committee may be aware, many states, including Vermont, have renewable portfolio standards, which require um, certain levels of uh, renewable production on the electric side. Um, this program in Connecticut was challenged by a developer who was developing a solar project outside of uh, Connecticut and was arguing that he should be allowed to participate in um, Connecticut's program, even though his, his project didn't meet the standard for participation. And the court in that case upheld the program, found that the geographic limitation imposed in that program for generating those credits for activities where they were being produced uh, was appropriate, and um, that states can design these programs to meet their specific needs. So I want to stop there on the Commerce Clause. I'm going to turn to the preemption doctrine, which is a much quicker presentation, to see if there are any questions high level on those issues. Representative Pat. Um, on the uh, California and Oregon uh, programs, is that, that is, that's, is that, when you say fuels, is that transportation? Transportation that's, fuels, that's the focus okay. of the program. Yes. So the other federal principle I think it's important for this committee and the legislature to have in mind is the preemption doctrine. Um, this uh, stems from the supremacy clause in the US Constitution, <coughs> and essentially says federal law is the supreme law of the land. Um, and when you look at this doctrine and apply it to state laws, you're looking at whether 
a state law is preempted by a federal program that's operating in the same area, either expressly or implied. Um, and that can occur, express preemption is where Congress says, we are implementing this program and states may not act in this area. Um, it's very clear. Implied preemption can be several different things. We often refer to it as a field preemption, where the, where the federal government has acted so pervasively in one area on a, a specific issue, there's really no room for the state to act and not be in conflict with that. So one of the things we wanted to look at is in the design of the Affordable Heat Act, are there any concerns with respect to preemption and, re and related federal statutory programs? Um, so we looked at a number of these in our, in our memo and a quick summary of the important ones to keep in mind. The Federal Natural Gas Act um, provides FERC the authority over intra, I'm sorry, interstate natural gas transportation and wholesale gas transactions. But it leaves to the state the regulation of the production and retail distribution of natural gas. Because um, natural gas, particularly through a... Um, natural gas utility is included in this program. We wanna make sure that we're reg the program is only regulating at the distribution level, which it is, not at the wholesale level. Um, so with that caveat, we don't see any concerns uh, with respect to preemption. Um, Clean Air Act also acts uh, in the space to regulate air pollution from emissions from both stationary and mobile sources. Um, but like the Natural Gas Act, it relies on both state and federal actions. So it's not uh, complete preemption. And it's very clear that states have substantial flexibility to regulate stationary sources more stringently than the federal baseline. So not a concern with acting in this manner to regulate CO2 emissions from uh, thermal sector heating fuels. I'm sorry, from heating fuels. Um, EPA's renewable fuel standard, um, this applies to some domestically produced renewable fuels, think biofuels. And, and acts to reduce emissions and limit oil imports uh, and requires blending a certain volume of renewable fuel. Again, courts have held that stricter state renewable fuel limits that are complementary to this program um, are permissible. So we don't, in reviewing how biofuels are incorporated into this program as proposed in the Affordable Heat Act, we don't see any concerns there. And the last one is the Energy Policy and Conservation Act. Um, think of that as the Energy Star program, essentially. Um, is there is, is any action been taken in the energy area that would preempt Vermont from taking more specific actions to require more efficient use uh, in those appliances? And there's nothing there that we think it raises to the level of the preemption concern. So um, I want to turn now just to let's see if I can get this without. A couple of <laughs> thoughts and then time for some questions. Um, we should be sure that the program that's being designed is not discriminating based on origin. Um, here, as similar to California and Oregon, the program is designed so that the evaluation of each clean heat measure is based on life cycle emissions, considering the, the fuel pathways that are required to get those products to the state. And it's not based on the origin of the alternative. So that, seems to check that box. Um, another topic that I know has been discussed a lot is, is the scope of jurisdiction. Where do we attach this obligation? And in our view, that obligated party, um, you should focus on jurisdictional transactions that are as far up the chain as possible, given the constitutional limitations. And this is a, you know, there's a tension here. How far can we go up the chain of commerce from the, you know, the retail distributor to the wholesaler to the producer uh, without running afoul of any constitutional questions. The way the language is written in the statute right now, um, there's no 100% guarantee that it will definitely pass muster in any of these things, but this is written in a way that is very protective of those concerns. And it's modeled on California and Oregon's language, as well as language we, we've used in the state of Vermont and other similar programs. So Right now, the obligated party is defined as a regulated natural gas utility serving customers in Vermont, or for other heating fuels, the entity that imports heating fuel for the ultimate consumption within the state, or the entity that produces, refines, manufactures, or compounds heating fuel within the state for ultimate consumption within the state. And for purposes of that section, to be very clear, the entity that imports heating fuel is the entity that has ownership to the title when the fuel is brought into the state. 
So that language is very similar to what they use in California and Oregon. They talk about the first fuel reporting entity, their, their obligated entity for liquid fuels is the producer or the importer of the, of the fuel. And they have similar language about the title requirement in terms of having title defining the importer. Oregon uses a very similar structure. And I, I did want to point out in Vermont, in our gas tax, motor vehicle tax provisions, we use language that's almost identical to define the scope of the state's jurisdiction over fuels coming into the state. So they, are, they talk about a distributor, but that means a person who imports or causes to be imported gasoline or other motor, motor fuel for use, distribution, or sale within the state, or any person who produces, refines, manufactures, compounds, gasoline, or other motor, vehicle, motor fuel within the state for use, distribution, or sale. Um, so the way the obligated party language is structured, I think both is, been, is consistent with what's been used in the past and upheld, and appropriately draws the line between where we can regulate and, uh, and uh, passing that as far up the chain as possible, given those limitations. Let me pause there. I know that was a lot. Um, but I'm happy to take any questions. Yes, thank you for joining us today and for your testimony. Yes. Representative Sevilla. Yes, thank you very much. Great resource for us as we're moving forward. Uh, just wanting to clarify and be sure yeah. um, that you've reviewed um, the language as passed by the Senate. I have, yes. Yep. Other questions? Thank you for, thank you again for joining us. That's my pleasure. Thanks. Uh, members, we will adjourn for the morning.